All right, let's just jump right into this. Andrew Tate. Long time. I know. It's been a very long time. Very long time. Actually, I met you downstairs at the Ritz. Correct. George and I were engaged at the time. Yep. And I probably was very swept up in George and barely got time to talk to you. But I do remember you being very polite. So it's interesting to fast forward to today. And you were very much in the UK circuit. Yeah. Now it seems like your celebrity is kind of really hitting the US market. They're kind of finding you for the first time, digging up a bunch of old clips. And there's a lot of pressure now on conservatives to yeah. say something really awful about you. There seems to be a pressure on everybody on all sides to say something awful about me. I kind of feel like uh, I've been placed in a position where there's always someone attacking me new each day. Um, but I guess that was built for it because it doesn't bother me like it should, perhaps. You seem to be doing pretty well given the circumstances. I know the truth of my heart, and I know that what I say is the truth, and I understand very well the internet and how it works, and I also think I'm perspicacious enough to understand there's certainly a degree of weaponized virtue, and perhaps a degree of jealousy, and perhaps a few other things that are involved in all of these attacks. I don't believe that people who sit and attack somebody for their past, especially something from so long ago, are genuinely virtuous. I don't think it's about virtue. I think it's about, well, I can get some clicks this way, or I can get some views that way, or he did the biggest interview ever, or whatever it is. There's certainly some other motivations. And uh, I don't want to say water off the duck's back. I don't want to come across as arrogant. However, I do believe that since the dawn of human time, every single king with any kind of empire was constantly at war. And I think if you're going to become one of the most famous people on the internet, you're going to be at war. And you'd be a fool to become massively influential and then cry about the fact that you end up in constant battles. It doesn't matter if you're Napoleon or Charlemagne or Genghis Khan. There's always someone prodding the edges of your empire trying to find weakness, see what a little bit of land they can take. And I think it's always been the same. And right now, I guess you could say, I, to a degree, I certainly have an empire and I'm massively influential. And there's a degree of, uh, I wouldn't say jealousy, but there's certainly some ambitious people who are trying to damage it. I think that's what it is. So I did see a, a mashup clip that we're not going to show because I, I thought it was unfair. I will say that. Yeah. Um, only because there was no context provided to the clips. It was, yep. it was just an extract of something that you said yep. uh, that 10 years ago, some of them were literally 10 years ago, yep. um, didn't know what year it was from, didn't know who you were talking to, didn't know what context it was. And I've been victimized online by something like that before where somebody takes something abstract and says, well, this is what must be what she means until they're provided the full context of the clip. Yep. And I also take exception to, I think, digging back 10 years. Um, I don't know who could survive that litmus test. I'm 34 years old today, yep. 10 years ago. Today, I speak to my audience. I talk about, they call be puritanical. I talk about, you know, not drinking. Yeah. I think the biggest change has been becoming a mother. Yeah. And it would really be unfair if we went and found Candace at 24 years old, liberal, dancing at One Oak and <laughs> said, well, look at these clips of Candace Owens. Fortunately, I had no cameras in my face 10 years ago. Yeah. You somehow did. Um, so I think it's a bit unfair. I also think that some of the critique that is coming your way is coming from people who are well-intentioned, like they actually don't perceive maybe perhaps, okay, this is 10 years ago, what the context is, has yeah. he changed since? So I will ask the question, and we are going to get into some of those clips. You said you're an open book. Yeah. How have you transformed? And I, I've seen changes just, I think, in the last five years. Yep. Who are yeah. you today? How have you transformed? That's a very good question. It's also very important when you talk about Candace from 10 years ago. The idea that you did something 10 years ago, which you would no longer agree with, is one thing. But the second thing, to, I, to come along to the conclusion that you now have no value to add to the world would be massively unfair right? Everybody changes and that's fine. I'm not the kind of person who's going to sit and apologize for his past. I believe all's well that ends well. I believe we're humans and we grow and we learn. I'd be a fool and I'd be disingenuous to sit here and pretend I was sorry for something I did in the past. And I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be very honest to everyone at home. I've talked at length for a very long time about my history and the fact I used to run a webcam business and I don't feel guilty for that. I know that's maybe what they want from me. I don't feel sorry for that. I've never hurt anybody. It has nothing to do with my current criminal case. Everybody who worked for me was very positive. In fact, my number one supporter is currently online and my best lifelong friends and some of the letters I got in jail were from people who worked for me at that time. And I had a business. And I'm not going to sit here and try and pretend that I feel guilty or I feel sorry for that. I'm from a low-income background. I did what I had to do to survive. And truthfully, all in all, being very honest, I don't think what I did was really that bad. And I want to say that, and I know people are going to lose their minds for it, but I didn't sell drugs. I didn't kill anybody. I mean, what did I do? 
I, I found a gap in the market and I helped some people organize some accounts on an internet website. That's what I did. And they're going to try and criticize me and crucify me for the next 100 years because of it, because of clips that were made 10 years ago. I think it's disingenuous and I don't think anyone actually really cares about the virtue of it because nobody who was involved in my life back then is complaining about anything. I think it's just an attack on me. And certainly we learn and we grow and we change, but it's very interesting how hypocritical the idea of looking at somebody's life over such a long period actually is. I mean, we can look at Donald Trump, right? Who I'm a fan of, I guess you're, I know you've had your ups and downs with him, but in the conservative sphere, he's pretty well respected. Donald Trump used to own the Miss Universe pageant. Are we going to criti criticize him? Are we going to crucify him? What about the girls he had in Miss Universe who decided to go on and do Playboy magazine? Is he a bad person now? Why? Now, that's not Christian values, right? It, it, people are messy and life is messy and nothing is completely clean. And this idea that you're going to find somebody and 10 or 11 years ago, they did something which might even be slightly distasteful, not even illegal. And you're going to crucify him forever. I just don't believe that's genuine virtue. I think it's just an attack. I do think what's happening right now is they are wrongly conflating you having run a webcam business, however long it was ago, to the criminal cases happening in Romania. And this is why I interjected in my voice when people were saying, he's not a conservative, he's not a Christian. I don't understand why Christians I, are giving him a platform. And I'm very sorry to interrupt. I'm very sorry to interrupt you. But yeah, I will say right now, I, I would never consider myself a conservative from that standpoint. Right. I'm a, ra I'm a rational actor. I'm a reasonable person. I'm intelligent. I use my brain. And I guess that makes me align with many conservative issues overall because the other side have lost their minds. I don't wake up and stand there as a conservative figure. I don't consider myself a conservative figure. I've just ended up aligning with them on a lot of core issues because I'm a forward-thinking, rational person. But I'm certainly not a conservative. I don't stand up and say, hey, I'm a conservative. I don't, I'm not interested in whether the conservative want to embrace me from that perspective or not. I have no interest in that. I wasn't even particularly political until my recent debacle where I realized a lot of things about the world and how avoiding politics will not save you, unfortunately. Yeah, that's, and that's one of the things I pointed out is I, was, I said, he's never said he was conservative. Why are we, he's, he is not identifying as a Christian. So why are we suddenly using that as whether or not a Christian, a conservative can put him on a platform and talk about something that is relevant and something that is relevant is whether or not you are being wrongly or unfairly persecuted by a government. Yeah. I have spoken on my platform after examining the charges against Harvey Weinstein. He's clearly not a conservative. He's yeah. about as far left as it really gets. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that I don't have an interest in whether or not he's guilty or not guilty and whether or not he was persecuted because of a overtly political movement like me too. So I, I, I do not like that these things are being conflated, but I want to park that aside because we are going to get into your case and just stick with what you just said about the webcam business. So you say you don't have any guilt for it. Um, I'm not sorry. I don't operate in that frame. I don't think it's an intelligent way for a man to go through life to say, I'm sorry. At, at a younger age, I did the best I could possibly do. And I did the best I believed at the time. And you grow from it and you learn. And perhaps there's times in your life where you look back and think, well, maybe I would, would have done this differently because hindsight's always 2020. But every rapper sold drugs. Like you get to a certain stage in your career where you no longer sell drugs and you don't do it anymore, but that's part of the life journey and life's messy. And I'm not going to sit here and apologize to any conservative who wants to sit me down and try and give me some moral high ground garbage. I'm not going to, I'm not going to listen to it. I had a very rough upbringing, a very tough life, and it could have been so much worse in so many ways. I've done nothing illegal. I've never hurt anybody. Everybody who was involved in my life back then are massive supporters of me. And I think it's very hypocritical for someone to sit, look at a situation they were not involved in and don't understand, look at old clips taken out of context, and then tell me and a whole bunch of people who were in my life who were all perfectly happy that something bad happened and something wrong happened. I don't think that's genuine. And for that reason, I'm not going to sit and uh, be preached to by these people who are imperfect themselves. Everybody's imperfect. And another thing that's really important, we talk about Christian values. I also think that I find it very interesting and ironic that I'm somehow the problem and that these Christians feel like they need to come and attack me now in, in the name of Christian values. I think Christianity has much bigger problems than Andrew Tate and some old clips. I think they have much bigger problems that are happening in their churches on a daily. I think you can go to a Christian church in a lot of America and be very disappointed in what you've seen. I don't think I'm the problem with Christianity. And yeah, it's very interesting, but there was a webcam company and I've talked about it at length on many different podcasts. I had a business. Many girls on there were perfectly fully clothed and would paint pictures or sing and dance and laugh. I've talked about this at length. I've had nothing to do with it for 10 or 11 years and nobody was ever hurt. And I 
I'm not sorry for it. I don't see why I should be. Okay. So the way that I read you, and you can definitely let me know if I'm wrong, obviously, because you are you, is that people that don't come from a lot, me and you, yeah. obviously, um, obviously have different decisions that lay before us in life than people that come from everything or people that come from a very stable household, two loving parents. Um, and this kind of gets into the dilemma. I remember years ago, Tommy Laren had said something, she's a political commentator in the US, had said something to the effect of, well, you know, Jay-Z used to sell crack. And he sort of laughed. And he probably did. And he did. And he sort of laughed this off. And I remember looking at that because I looked up to Jay-Z's music so much, yeah. you know, and I looked up to him because it made it possible for me to change my circumstances. Are like you looking at this guy yeah. who comes from nothing? He came from the projects. He sold drugs. And then he does, doesn't have to sell drugs anymore. And he's now talking about ideas and talking about business. So I was able to more closely understand and go, okay, I can actually climb out of these circumstances, even though I didn't wasn't born, you know, with a ton of wealth and a lot of opportunities that some, like some people were. Yeah. And I think it's very difficult for people that don't come from nothing to understand that. And they're so sure that if they were in desperate circumstances that they would still never do anything. But this is their massive mistake. And you're right, but this is their massive mistake. The reason I have such huge affinity with the youth of the world today, especially the masculine youth, is one, because a lot of them are disenfranchised, which is one conversation. But two, also the reason my reach is so global, the reason I have so many fans in Slovenia and Southside Chicago and I've been, I've had kids from Ulaanbaatar come up to me, Mongolia, all around the world is because I speak to the disenfranchised. And part of that is always going to be, or is going to involve financially disenfranchised. I'm, I'm someone who comes from absolutely nothing and made himself into something. And unfortunately there's a rocky road sometimes like you just described with Jay-Z to get that done. But if I would have been born into a perfect family, like you said, two loving parents, family was rich, white picket fence, and I was saying all the same things, then they wouldn't have the same affinity. So if you look at even a lot of superheroes, you look at Batman, he's a flawed person. And I think the reason I'm seen as a hero and the reason I have the fan base I have is because to a degree, I've always been a flawed person and I'm not a perfect human and I don't want to be. And I think that that actually adds a lot of credibility to my character as a whole, that I've become the kind of person who believes he can add value to the world. And just like you said with Jay-Z, he changed. And... The biggest thing for me personally, though, truthfully, and I want the whole world to understand this, I've been forensically analyzed by multiple different federal agencies from different countries for the last 17 months, analyzing every aspect of my entire life across the last 10 to 15 years. And what did they find? An old YouTube clip? That's the worst they could find. No sexual perversion, no drugs, no genuine criminal acts. They found something semi-immoral in a YouTube clip. And I would actually challenge anybody who wants to throw stones at me to go through the same level of scrutiny I have been under. And let's see what they find in your life. Because I guarantee anyone who's watching this right now, you sit there, you have a secret in your closet. You have a skeleton that you don't want anyone to know about. And they would have found it. So what's the worst thing that they found about me, considering I've been the most attacked man in the world for 17 months? An out, an out of date YouTube clip? An out of context YouTube clip? Is that the worst? I think, it's, I think it's crazy that people aren't even sitting there and going, okay, this guy's been absolutely attacked and from every single angle, and this is the worst they could possibly drag up. Right. No, I agree with you. So I, the question I would ask you, though, and it, because obviously you've moved away from that business, you now, the thing I find to be the most interesting about you is that younger boys yep. love you. Yes. They absolutely, like the 12, 13-year-old, 14-year-old, I, I, I have not come across a 12, 13-year-old boy who's not just an Andrew Tate stan. Yeah. And I think that's, it's remarkable. It gives you a lot of power. And I think this is perhaps the interest that a lot of people have in you is what are you going to do with this power, right? You have yeah. all these boys, they believe in you, they stand up for you. And that is why it becomes important to state, I'm not sorry that I lived this. I don't think I would say that I'm sorry for anything that I, decisions that I made when I was young either, because that, this is the deck of hands that I was given. What do you want me to do? Yeah. But at the same time, I do try to now knowing that I have such a following of, of a lot of young ladies that follow me say like, listen, I did the idiot stuff. So you don't have to. power, power and responsibility go hand in hand. And that's the thing that's so interesting. These out of date clips. And they want to talk about these things from 10 years ago. At the time when I was talking to camera, those videos were made for private circulation initially. Secondly, I wasn't trying to educate the world in anything back then. I didn't have the kind of power and influence I have back then. The way you say something to a video, which has 50 viewers, has to be different than the way you say something to a video that has 50 million viewers. Mm -hmm. Power and responsibility absolutely go together. And I understand that very well. And I understand the power I have. And I do believe I'm now 
an absolute force for good in the world. And I'm far more careful with how I'll project myself with certain ideas. Absolutely agree completely. But that's the thing that's even so crazy about all of it. These old videos everyone's so concerned about wouldn't even circulate if my haters weren't constantly trying to use them against me. They're, right. they're, they'd be disappeared into the history of the internet. I don't know where these things come from. I don't know where they were found. I don't know where they are. It's kind of crazy. A lot of people are making all these constant attacks on me. And I don't watch a lot of it. I'll have to be honest with you, Ken Dace. I don't watch all of it. But a lot of the videos are so outdated. The only reason they even exist now is because my haters are so desperate trying to take me down. They don't have any concern for them being seen because they wouldn't be sure circulating them otherwise. Mm -hmm. So yeah, absolutely. Power and responsibility go hand in hand. And I do believe that I now have a huge platform. And with young boys, they're ex exceptionally interested in my case. I do believe to a degree I'm an anti-hero. I do believe to a degree that the harder I'm attacked, the more credibility is given to me in the eyes of my fans. I think that they see, ah, everyone's out to get this guy. Everyone was out to get Batman. This kind of feels that way. And I do try and lead everyone down a good path and say extremely positive things. And I don't think anybody is finding any clips from the last five to six years which have anything negative in them. Right. I, th I think you've changed. I, that's why I said over the last five years, I think there's been there's been a seismic shift. And speaking to boys, the like younger boys, I think one of the things that they're really suffering from, I get tons of responses rather unexpectedly whenever I talk about the topic of pornography on my show. And it's one of those things that, again, if you found Candace 10 years ago and you asked me about pornography, and by the way, this was actually implanted into my head from a health school like from health education, where they would say pornography is healthy, people should watch pornography, people should engage in pornography, it's okay if you're in a relationship for you to watch pornography. And then I had a huge wake-up call when I spoke to Tim Ballard, you know, uh, he runs Operation Underground, and then I realized how closely pornography is related to human sex trafficking. Real sex trafficking, not, real, not TikTok Real sex accounts. trafficking, and yeah, we should talk about that because they are kind of stretching the definition of sex trafficking in your case. I've taken a look at it. And What's remarkable to me is the amount of young men, and I would say from the ages of 18 to 35, that write in and say how much they're struggling with porn, yeah. how much they're struggling with pornography addiction, um, how they feel that no person is talking about the ills of pornography. Yeah. And so I just watched this clip of you this morning sitting next to Adam, 22. You were ever interested in doing your first ever double penetration scene that me and Lena, I, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for you, but I feel like- Yo, dude. Would he be a suitable candidate? Would you, would, can I tap him in? I don't know. No. Well, he looks Oh, yeah, can, I, can I can I fill in real quick, Andrew? You know, you're out, Aiden. We can't for you. You're not in. You're not in this conversation anymore. <laughs> Fair enough. Go ahead, Andrew. Would you? Would you? Would you? Andrew, would you double penetrator, bro? Would, would you? Would you do that, Andrew? Go ahead. Finish the answer. Question. If all pop together, is is that chill? There's absolutely zero percent chance of that happening. <laughs> And it's not because Elena is particularly unattractive. It's because she's married to Adam and I have no interest in d degenerate pointless sex and I have no interest in making a spectacle of myself or even just involving myself in anything which I deem to be overall haram and pointless. It's just not something I'd be interested in. There's not a, there's not a single amount of money on the planet you could pay me to, to undertake. So You were very polite. I'm not going to be so polite. I thought he was an absolute degenerate. Um, and, and And I mean that the idea of having a woman making the vows that you make in marriage and literally offering her body as he did to you was a form of degeneracy. And you were being very nice and measured. And I think that for that moment, that was the best thing that you possibly could have done because she looked quite vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, Lena, I think is her name. Yeah. But how do you reconcile that now, right? You're in a circumstance like this. You're being polite. You did say I'm uncomfortable. You did say that I would never do this. And I think that that was really important for you to say, but you're not the same person. I mean, how did, how did you, Yeah. even reflecting on it, it yeah. it's so disgusting. He offered you his wife. It is pretty disgusting. And it's also pretty misogynistic because he didn't ask her. He no. offered her. I felt sorry for her. So I was very measured with my conversation with them because I felt sorry for her. I could tell she was nervous. She was swinging on the chair back and forth. She didn't want to be there. She felt extremely nervous. And I think that it, only a coward would berate a very nervous, very scared woman, even if she did something which I personally disagree with, even if I think Adam is personally, he doesn't align with my morals. Because she was so nervous and because she was so almost afraid she looked. Mm -hmm. And I think she expected me to go, go at her hard. So I just felt sorry doing it. I, I, I just didn't. I couldn't find, maybe I'm getting soft in my old age, but I thought, I think she knows what I think. And I think she knows what the world thinks. And I think if I go at her too hard, 
it's just going to break her. And I don't really like the idea of her, you know, turning off the camera and bawling her eyes out. I think that God will teach her the lessons she needs to learn from her experience, both positive and negative. And I think that's God's job to do and not necessarily mine. But yeah, it was certainly uncomfortable and it shows how degenerate the world is becoming. And pornography as a whole is simply just, I think, a, I think it's an effect. I think it's a, a tool which is used to ensure that the male populace stays as docile as possible. Mm. I don't think that any of the things that are happening to the male population are accidental. I think that keeping us as docile as possible is very interesting for the people who are in charge of the world because we're the warrior class. At the end of the day, it's going to boil down to the men who are going to stand up and actually do something about anything at some point of, at some point in time. So I think they like the idea of us being docile. And I mean, how much more docile can you get than a man staring, sitting there looking at a screen, not even want to reproduce for real because he's just staring at a screen? And I think that's just the next stage in the slave mind. And it's everywhere now. Whereas, and, and this is something that my husband says, he doesn't have any social media because he's like, Instagram is pornography. I open my Instagram and I've got Emily Rojkowski's butt cheeks. Yeah. And I'm not a man, so I don't have that same yeah. biological reaction to seeing it. But I can only imagine how difficult it is for a man when you open an app and you've got Kim Kardashian offering her body to Emily Rojkowski. Even if you're walking down the street, I've realized even how desensitized I've become to pornography because you see an ad for Gucci and for whatever reason, she's got to be completely naked while she's holding the bag. I remember in my lifetime, I remember in my lifetime, there were music videos that got censored or banned or can only be played after 10 or 11 at night. And if you watch them now, you'd be like, what? For what? What is that? A bikini? Like, it's nothing. It's amazing how quickly it has degenerated. And yeah, absolutely. And we're all degenerating with it. Like, like I've realized the fact that I don't have a reaction to seeing the half-naked woman holding a Gucci bag yep. means that I have been desensitized to pornography. And I can only imagine what that does to men. Oh, completely. And it's, it's, but this is what the powers that be want. They want to make sure that the male populace is as docile as possible. And they do that with a, a large array of weapons. And they do that with a web of tools. And I believe that I'm the counter to that, which is the reason I ended up attacked in the first place. But unfortunately, when you buy into the slave man mind programming, you do not become the kind of man who can easily attract a, a woman because you're not attractive to females as a whole. So how do you satisfy yourself? You end up sitting there staring at a screen and they convince you that's a good life to live as a man and that's perfectly fine and perfectly normal. And you don't even get to genetically reproduce. I do also though, and I want to make this clear, I do believe in absolute and utter self-accountability as a man. I think as a man, everything that happens to you is your fault. Me going to jail was my fault. Me being attacked online was my fault. If all these bad things that happened to me, I will take responsibility for, even if I believe they were unfair or unjust. And I think that any man who's going to sit there and say, I'm, I'm struggling, I'm struggling, he also needs to wake up and understand that if you're going to truly struggle to not click on a website, then you're going to deserve the terrible life you're going to live. And the devil or the matrix or whoever you want to call them are going to fill your life with temptations. They're going to fill your life with easy way outs that they're, they're going to want you to take because the good road is usually the hardest road. And if you're going to continue to fall for them, then you're going to have to suffer the consequences of that. So it's, it's, it's double-edged. It's certainly difficult that pornography is everywhere and men are struggling with it. But to me, what's even more upsetting is that these men don't have enough fortitude and enough mental strength to wake up and say, I'm better than that. Okay. But, but, but this is, this is the thing, right? So I'm about to get started, Candace. Good. Get started. This is the thing, but this is the thing, right? So when you attack a man's mental fortitude on one issue, you attack it on all issues. This is why it's done purposefully to resist a slave mind. You need to be able to resist in the first place. How can you resist a slave mind if you have no physicality, you have no willpower, no ability to mentally resist anything? Well, then what are you going to end up doing? You're going to end up eating the bugs and watching the porn and sitting in front of your computer. And that's what they want from, from the people. So I think that it's actually all very interconnected. People come at me with the porn problem and I get the same thing. Guys say to me all the time, hey, what are you going to do? What should I do? I struggle with pornography. And I say, that's because you have nothing else in your life in order. If you were in good physical condition, and you had the money you were supposed to have, and you had the mentality you were supposed to have, you wouldn't need it. So the reason you're so addicted to porn is because everything else in your life is a failure. And yeah, it's certainly a complicated issue. It's a difficult one. And this is why they fear male agency so much, because when men truly wake up and decide to be the best versions of themselves, they're hard to control because all these control mechanisms fall by the wayside. They don't want the porn anymore. They don't want the antidepressants anymore. They don't want the garbage anymore. And now you have a whole bunch of men who actually want truth and honor and respect, and they want to live for something. And then what are they going to live for? They're going to want to be brave. They're going to want to do the right thing, regardless of how dangerous it may be for their own personal circumstance. And that sounds like a difficult population to enslave. And that's, that's what's scary. So how do you reconcile, uh, first off, how long ago was your webcam business? Yeah, so I stopped, I stopped having any involvement with it, I think eight to nine years ago I stopped. It was a long time ago. It was at the early stages of the internet. 
And I'll explain it one more time for people. I've explained it already at length, but I'll explain it from the beginning. I had a company I was fighting at the time. And on a side note, I actually want to make this clear. We talk about things people have done in the past for money. I beat, I beat people up for money. I hurt people for money. I don't often tell people this. And I, I think it's the first interview I've mentioned it in. There's a person who can never walk the same again because he fought me. I've had 87 professional fights and I did my best to kill people. You're going to sit here and talk about what I did for money. I literally hurt people for money. And uh, so I, I'm a perfect person. I'm, I'm not sorry for my kickboxing career or my cage fights. I'm not sorry for any of them. I had bare knuckle fights. I'm not sorry for any of them, right? I was a person who had to pay the bills. I lived the life I lived. I used the tools I had. And I ended up opening a webcam company where girls would sit on a laptop and they would talk to guys on the internet for money. That's what they would do. The girls would sit there fully clothed or a bikini. Some of them would paint pictures. Some of them would sing songs. It's very similar to Twitch's now. Twitch is almost more sexual than the sexual websites were back then. I helped the girls set up accounts. We worked together. I helped them become as popular as possible. And everybody made money and everybody was happy. And nobody is complaining about it. Nobody's upset about it. None of the girls who worked for me are upset about it. The government are after me for it. It's perfectly legal. Nothing's wrong with it. There's just a whole bunch of people who now think that they can take the moral high ground against me because I, per I previously ran this company. And I think I can anticipate the question you're going to ask. How do I reconcile with the fact that I used to produce pornography right. or degree porn porn pornographic content? Now men are writing to you like, how do I? And now men are trying to escape yeah. it. Yeah. That's a really good question. There's a few different ways I can answer that question. I think the first way I'll answer it is if you own a liquor store and an alcoholic comes in and you refuse to sell him alcohol, does he stop being an alcoholic? No. He just goes and buys from someone else. So that's the co that's the cop out answer. The cop out is well, they were all these people who are addicted are always going to be addicted regardless of whether I did it or not. So that's the cop out answer. But the second answer I can give, which I think is more detailed and probably more nuanced, is. One, I intimately understand the relationship between men and these websites. I've had and seen men give away their life savings to girls they've never met. I've watched and I've seen it. And I actually think a lot of the insights I give, a lot of the things I tell the world about the male men mental health crisis, about men being so constantly lonely, about how important it is to build yourself into a high value man, about how money alone is not enough. I explain all these things. A lot of these are lessons from the webcam days. I saw dudes who had a whole bunch of money, no other attributes, and they ended up on these websites spending hundreds of thousands of dollars because they didn't have anything else. So I think I learned a lot of important life lessons and I do my best to try and pass them on to people. But I guess also, and this is the final answer I want to give about this whole subject, is that I do think I can take the question you're asking and reverse engineer it and use it against the people who are trying to attack me for it. My, my answer to it would be, how do you sit and want to criticize me for being involved in the production of pornography 10 or 11 years ago if you're involved in the consumption of it? Because you're creating a market for it. So anybody who wants to sit and say that I did things wrong, that's fine. You're allowed to throw stones. But if you're in a glass house, if you have ever signed up to an OnlyFans account, if you have Instagram, if you're following these models on Instagram who you don't know, who are showing their tits and ass all day, if you've watched porn, if you fancy or think some beautiful woman on a, on a movie, if you're going to live in lust yourself and you're funding this entire industry, you're downstream, you're at the bottom of it. How can you then take the moral high ground on the person who's producing it? That doesn't make sense to me. So if you've totally abstained from pornography your entire life and you've never looked at it ever and you've never been involved with it ever and you're a perfect person and you want to come along and say what I did was wrong, that's fine. But I don't think most people who are complaining can even say that. I don't think they can. And I now will once again state this and I state this for, as a matter of almost fact. The level of investigation I have gone under, the level of forensic investigation my life has been submitted to. Most people don't understand. Most people have never been through what I've been through. They've not had their entire life forensically analyzed. Every word they've ever said, everyone they've ever spoken to, every WhatsApp chat, everything, head to toe by federal agencies for the last 10 years. And the most they come up with is that I ran a webcam company, which I've already admitted to. That's it. Take these people who criticize me and see how many porn websites they've been on. Get their laptops. See the they've Googled. See who they've spoken to. Like, it's... It's all massively hypocritical. I do understand that some people would hear that and go, oh, you know, he's a bad person, et cetera. I don't think I was a bad person. I never hurt anybody. I think I could have done much worse things. I know many people from my circumstances who did many things worse than what I did. And all in all, I'm not going to sit and pretend I'm sorry for something I'm not sorry for. And I, I just want to make it clear to the world that, like you said, people come from different backgrounds and, and people grow and people change, et cetera. But I also look at the world in a different way. I think that we're all constantly doing our best. 
I think I'm doing the best I can right now. When I'm 55, I might watch this interview and think I'm an idiot, right? And I think we're all constantly doing our best. And I did the best I could do at the time. And I don't think it makes sense for me to hate past me for doing his best. I just don't think that's a very constructive mindset. Living a healthy lifestyle can be challenging when you're always on the go. You need simple, manageable routines to make sure that you're getting the proper nutrition every single day, which is why I'm a huge fan of Balance of Nature. Balance of Nature fruits and veggies capsules are a great way to make sure that you're getting essential nutritional ingredients every single day. Through Balance of Nature's advanced cold vacuum process, the vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients of the fruits and vegetables are preserved so you can get the vital nutrition in each capsule. Balance of Nature is a whole food supplement with no additives, fillers, extracts, synthetics, pesticides, or added sugar. The only thing that's in their capsules is pure fruits and vegetables. They sent a bunch of fruit and veggie capsules to the studio for my team and I to try, and the whole team is feeling brighter, healthier, and more energetic. When you're disciplined enough to take care of your health, you'll reap all kinds of benefits. Make Balance of Nature fruits and veggies a part of your daily diet. Your body will thank you. For a limited time this summer, when you become a preferred customer at Balance of Nature, they're throwing in a free fruit and veggies travel set, giving an additional $25 off your first order. So go to balanceofnature.com and use promo code Candice for a free travel set and $25 off your first order as a preferred customer. That's balanceofnature.com, promo code Candice. Yeah, I think it's really important for conservatives, people that identify and say, I'm a conservative, to recognize that the people... It's not people that are perfect that are bringing people over to our side. I was not brought over to conservative principles by people preaching at me and telling me how perfect their lives were. Uh, it was actually people that were much more broken that led me here, it's, which is fascinating. I got interested in business because of Jay-Z. Yeah. I criticize him all the time now about things that he does. But, but you're not— I you're... got interested you know, Kanye, in, in Kanye West, you know, him doing a Christian album and things of that nature. It, you need people that are flawed. You, you need people that are real. This is the thing. I'm not particularly political. I didn't consider myself particularly political, but it looks like I'm kind of ending up there. And like I said, I'm a realist, which puts me on the conservative side, and I'm not stupid. And I understand very well about the world and propaganda and what they're trying to do to us. So you end up being a conservative by default. But you're a real person if you have flaws. If you want to sit and tell a, dis a disadvantaged youth growing up in the south side of Chicago what, how he's supposed to live his life from your perfectly manicured garden and your white picket fence, you're not going to get through to that person. They don't care actually, what you have to it, say. It actually becomes a bit of a turnoff. I, Absolutely. I it's like in, and I, those are the things about me that I don't think will ever change, which is why I, I get your following. I get what people like about you. It's why you say the disenfranchised follow you. And I think it's important for people to understand that. Like there was no way, like, and I still have no respect for her at all, yeah. but it's why I snap so hard at like the Megan McCain's. I'm like, who the hell are you? What have you done yeah. in your life that you think I'm going to take advice? What, you've just been someone's daughter, right? What have you worked for? Absolutely. What have, what, have, what have you survived? Tell me something that you lived through in your life that was a struggle. You can't yeah. because your life has been perfect. And so I think it's it's so foolish to think that I'm going to take a lesson, me, that I'm more likely to take a lesson from a Meghan McCain, who I don't even think is a conservative. I think she's just a rich girl and got rich in way worse ways than you got rich. Yeah. What was daddy doing overseas? Yeah. Um, and that, that's a really amazing point because we can also look at that, right? Conservatives will sit here and attack me. We can... The, there are people who are making millions from blowing children to pieces. Yeah. Like let's let's get the world in perspective here for Oh, a but it's cleaner. They didn't get their hands they didn't get their hands dirty. Of course. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you. And and that's why I am never the first to bark. Uh, when someone is suddenly assessing someone's entire life, I'm like, look at your entire, you are literally built on the backs of, of dead Iranian children. What Absolutely. And, and and I'm standing up here also, and I'll make this very clear. Like, I've not tried to avoid this judicial process. I've not tried to run away from anything. I'm standing here saying, if, if I've committed a crime, put me in jail. And if I haven't committed a crime, the, the what can you say I've done? I perhaps could, you could argue it was slightly immoral, perhaps. But I also, to a degree, maybe I'm a libertarian. I think if 20 people or 30 people get in a room and they all agree to do something and it makes them happy, then they should be allowed to do it. If nobody's hurt and nobody's upset by it, then they should do it. And perhaps that does make you a liberta libertarian. If 30 full-grown men decide to go into a room and be gay and they want to be gay, then they should be allowed to go be gay. You're 30 men. You're not hurting anybody. It's what you want to do. If you want to wear red t-shirts, wear red t-shirts. If me and my brother had 30 people, we all got together and everyone made money and everyone was happy. Who's others to come along and criticize and say people are victims, people are upset, this is wrong, this is bad, etc. So. Yeah, you're completely right. It's amazing how people throw stones and how imperfect everybody is, truly. And I think the best thing you can do as a man is obviously learn your lessons from your life and try your best to pass them on. I feel like I'm doing that to the best of my ability. But also, 
another thing that conservatives is going to blow their minds is going to really upset them. What they don't understand about especially the strength of my message is that to especially the young boys of the world, I'm cool. I'm cool. And, and I know they think that doesn't matter, but if you want to sit behind a desk and go, da, 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 the Republican Bill 304, nobody can, you're a dork. So no one gives a shit, right? You're a nerd. I've got the big cars and pretty women and I, I live the lifestyle. If you want to really capture the youth of today, you need to get some kind of affinity with them. They need to at least want to be you to a degree. You need to at least be their hero to a degree. This is where liberalism wins. I don't think a lot of conservatives understand that liberalism is sexy. You do drugs, you run around, you burn stuff. It's cool. You get a party. Because what do conservatives do? Stay home, stay home, stay home. It's boring, right? At least... What they don't understand is that conservatives will sit there and go, he's a terrible role model because he has all these pretty girls in this fast car and he's a materialistic. Da -da. That's the only. That's the reason I can actually help the world. That's the reason young boys will listen to me. You said it yourself, 14, 15-year-old boys, they'll look at my life and go, okay, I want to listen to this guy. They don't want to listen to me if I sit behind a desk and read Republican Bill 308. I don't read that crap. I don't know. And they don't care. I agree with you. I mean, I, I think one of the criticisms that I faced was that I care too much about culture on my podcast. I'm like, culture is interesting. Culture is what is changing minds and changing hearts. 100%. So if we don't want to compete with liberals in the cultural space, then what are we doing this for? A hundred percent. What do you think the young kids, do you really think that they're, like you said, following a Senate bill that just hit the desk? Or do you think that how you convey that to them and how you're talking about ideas actually matters and, and culture matters? And it's something that conservatives gave up yeah. um, many years ago. That and they wonder why they lose. And then we call it- Trump was cultural. Trump was cultural. Yeah. Trump was fake news. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was, Trump was a hero. And to be a hero, you have to be a, attacked and you have to be an imperfect person. And, and that's the reality of the world. And culture is super important. And you're right in regards to conservatives giving up. I, I'm trying to think of conservative culture now. I mean, I like to think that we're making degeneracy unpopular. I like to think that there are some good voices out there that is making God cool again. I actually like to believe the pendulum is swinging. Mm -hmm. I do believe it and I see it online and it's a combination of so many small things coming together almost in perfect timing, but it is cultural. You need a cultural shift that moves away from this insanity. And you're right. If you just want to sit, sit there and just preach, nobody's going to be interested in it. And I also think that especially in the masculine realm, I can't talk for being a woman, but I can talk for being a man. In the masculine realm, we certainly like to see people lead by absolute and our example. Because traditionally, we would be following our commander or the man we respected into war. So we'd like to know he can at least fight. You'd like to see he's at least brave. You'd like to see him lead by example. And I think especially if conservatives want to win the culture war, then they need to lead by example. If you're going to, if you're going to be a conservative preacher and you want to tell men about how they should live their lives, you should be as strong as possible. You should look in shape. You should be big. You should show you're motivated, you're disciplined. You should, you should absolutely, of course, you, we all have vices, but you should be very disciplined with your outlook. And you should make it very clear to the outside world that what you've done wrong, what you haven't done wrong, you should take accountability. I think you need to lead by example. I don't think you can preach to men. I don't think you can preach to young boys. I think that's the reason why they don't do so well in school in, in general. I don't think that's the reason why they're disenfranchised. I think you need to just lead by example and let them follow. And I feel like I'm kind of doing that by just live, by just standing up and saying, no, this is who I am and I'm unapologetic for it. And this is what I've done. And this is what I intend on doing. And I try and I'm going to try and save the world. So I want to shift gears here and talk about your dad. Cause I'm quite fascinated by your dad. He passed recently. Yeah. How many years ago? Uh, nine, I think nine years, nine years ago. Yeah. But wow, just wasn't <laughs> what I was expecting. A chess champ yeah. served the country. Um, his name was Emery. Yeah. Really interesting to talk about just, I guess, your upbringing with him as this chess champ. How did he get into chess? Yeah, my, I, I do believe I had the best father on the planet. A lot of the things I regurgitate are regurgitated from him. A lot of the things I say, he literally said to me line for line. I believe that he was very morbid in his approach to life. And he wanted me to understand that he will not be here forever. And he wanted me to understand that when he was gone, I had a duty to fulfill. He talked about dying a lot, which I guess is kind of unusual, but he would, even though he was relatively young. He died when he was 58. But he was a chess, yeah, he was a chess professional. He was a professional chess player. He was one of the best chess players in the world. And he 
What's most interesting about him is he almost predicted the future absolutely and utterly perfectly. He was talking about the Ukraine-Russia war back in 2013, and he was talking about how the gay children, gay people can't have children, so they're going to come for your children. Trust me, that's what they're going to do. The children are next. Like, he'd say all these things back like 10 or 11 years ago, and I'd be like, all right, Dad, you're a bit crazy. Calm down. But uh, I guess when you're a chess player, you see the future. And he raised me with absolute accountability, and he certainly raised me and Tristan to be he understood what the world expects of men, and he raised us to be strong. And even when we were in jail, my mother would call, I'd speak to her on the phone, and she'd say, how are you doing? And I'd say, oh, don't worry. And my, she would say, yeah, dad raised you for this. Like, we were always raised to be warriors. So I don't think I could have possibly ever had a better father. I, I, I'm going to miss him forever. And I think the best thing I can do is be the best version of myself to give honor and respect to him. And I think that's the best thing. Where did he pick up chess? It's quite unusual. He's American. He's he was American. American. Yeah. Black American. Yeah. I don't know too many black American chess players, full stop. Yeah. Um, where did he pick up chess? He taught himself. And he taught himself and he just read a couple books. I think he read three chess books and ended up being one of the best players in the world. And it's incredible. It, it's incredible. But it's actually interesting when you talk about, we were just discussing in affinity and how people are imperfect people and how it uh, allows you to actually teach things better. My father, towards the end of his chess career especially, made most of his money teaching chess in inner city schools because he's a big black guy. Mm -hmm. So the children would be like, ah, Okay, I'll listen to this man. You're right. So it's amazing how affinity is real and coming from a certain socioeconomic background is real. And, you know, we all talk about how ridiculous racism is, but also to a degree, pattern recognition is real. I look like him. I can be like him. These things are real. So, yeah, he, he did fantastically well in terms of teaching, especially disadvantaged children. And uh, he taught himself, and I wish I had his mind. I'm not nearly as intelligent as he was. I wish I was. you be real smart to be a good chess player. You've got to be better than smart. I actually think you go beyond the realm of smart into a... I wouldn't say he was on the spectrum, but you certainly get to a new level of socio interactions. Do you understand? I'd go to chess tournaments when I was a kid, and everybody there would be a world-level chess player, and everyone was a bit strange, a little bit. Um, I don't know if it's like that anymore. I, I see the chess community has now moved online. There's a lot of them playing online. They seem a lot more normal than the grandmasters I remembered. <laughs> I remembered old grandmasters, half drunk, ex-KGB, shaking at the board. The yeah, yeah, like uh, it was a bit different back then. But um, yeah, I wish I had his level of intellect. He was certainly the smartest person I've ever known. And even when he died, I got endless emails from people I'd never heard of who just said, I, I worked with your dad and I don't think you understand how smart he was. He I, served America, yeah? He served America. He was in the Air Force and he was a linguist for the CIA. He, he joined the Air Force and ended up being a linguist for the intelligence. What other languages did he speak? He spoke Russian, German, Spanish, and English. But officially, he was supposed to speak Russian. He learned, he assimilated Russian in two weeks. I think he holds the Air Force record. Okay, so he's, he's very smart. Yeah, super, ridiculously smart. Yeah. I got an email from somebody when he died and they said that, I just want to send you an email. You don't know who I am. I was serving with your father in the armed forces. I don't, you tell everybody your dad was smart. And they're not going to understand how smart he was. And I want to give you a quick story. I was living with a Russian woman, and I already spoke Russian conversationally when I began the Air Force training to learn Russian. Your father knew nothing, didn't know the alphabet, didn't know nothing. And within two and a half weeks, he was correcting everybody, including the professor on Russian. Yeah. So, like, he just read the dictionary. I saw my dad sit there and read a dictionary. Just read it. And that was it. Yeah. It's like photographic memory. Like he was on, on a spectrum. Yeah. Some, something else going on. Yeah, something else. Well, the little X-Men. Emery Tate was his name, and everyone called him E.T. Yeah. Like, he was tough on e. you. E. He was certainly tough on me, and I, I, can't, I can't express enough how grateful I am for that. I, we live in a world now where I'm going to say that my dad hit me when I made a mistake, and everyone's going to lose their minds. And they're going to pretend I was somehow abused, and that somehow my childhood was terrible. And I could not thank, if he was come down to earth today, I would shake his hand and say, thank you for absolutely everything you gave me, including discipline, including understand that, understanding that in the harsh realities of the real world, there is a line. And if you cross that line, violence appears. That's the unfortunate reality of earth. <laughs> There's a line. And if you cross it, violence will appear, either from a cop or from a guy on the street or from someone you don't like, or even a friend will turn on you, whatever. There's a line that sh shouldn't be crossed. And I learned that from a very young age, and I'm very thankful for that. I'm not sitting here saying a kid should be abused. There's a difference between abuse and discipline, of course. Everyone with a brain understands that. But he was extremely tough on me. And if I could change anything about my childhood, I'd only wish he was tougher. Because right. life's tough. Life's hard. And I think that the best thing you can possibly do as a man is prepare for the endless difficulty that's going to come your way. There's no, there's no way out as a man. You're either going to have a very difficult life to become somebody important, or you're going to suffer the difficulty, difficulty of being invisible. What do you want to do? You want to be invisible 
and just hide and, and work in Starbucks and never have a girlfriend who truly loves you and nobody care if you live or die? Or do you want to go out there and be top G and be the most famous man in the world and have government agencies trying to lock you up for no reason, putting you in a dungeon? You have to make a choice. It's going to be difficult either way. So I think if you have a son and you're not preparing him for absolute difficulty, you're doing him a disservice. I think that's what has to happen as a man. And it's, I've said this many times before, but I'm going to say it again. I don't think many people understand exactly how competitive the masculine world is. Men are constantly in competition with each other. We always have been. We used to go to war and fight and kill each other. I guess in some places we still do. Maybe that's calmed down a little bit. But in the masculine world of today, everybody is constantly competing for everything. The car that you want, other people want. The woman you want, other pe people want. The house you want, other people want. You're competing to have all of it. And how do you do that? You do that through status and money and influence and power. It's war. I don't think many re women realize that when two men even meet each other for the first time, it's like an unspoken, maybe tiny bit at the back of the mind. There's a tiny analysis of, could I fight this man? Yes. That's real. <laughs> it's super real. You go up and say, hello, hello. Mm, he's more than a one punch issue. That's it. <laughs> oh, he's one punch. He's one punch. Mm, he's three or four. That's the reality of the masculine world because we've evolved. If you believe in evolution, but I, my, my views are mixed, but we've evolved to be in this position where we're constantly analyzing possible threats and we're constantly analyzing people who, who perhaps are on our team or snakes, et cetera. And I think that not many people understand exactly how brutally competitive the masculine world is. And I think the worst thing you can do for a son is just to raise him in a bubble. I, my dad, I'll say it here, the people are losing minds. My dad used to just randomly push me over. I'd be like three. You just said, <laughs> not hard, but just get up, boy. Okay. <laughs> and mom would be like, why are you doing that, son? He's like, you get pushed over. That's life. My mom hated that mm -hmm. she did that to me. But uh, yeah, I, I can give him nothing but praise. I, I'm really so thankful I had the, the upbringing I had. Do you think he's proud of you? I'm certain he's proud of me. And it's amazing how much strength I can get from that. It's amazing how much strength you can get from knowing that your ancestors are looking down on you and you're doing your absolute best. I also believe that God can be proud of you when you do your absolute best. And I don't think many people genuinely do their best in the world anymore. When I say do your best, people sit and go, oh yeah, okay. No, when's the last time you actually did your best? Like, I don't train to run marathons, but I know if I gave my best, I could run a marathon right now, first try. If I gave my best, life depending on it. When's the last time people have re genuinely given their best to anything? There are people going through the world and going through life today that don't give their best or 100% effort to anything ever. Ever. They can't even remember the last time they tried. So when I'm sitting in a dungeon, I'm sitting in a Romanian jail cell, I understand that it is a chance that God has given me and my ancestors are watching for me to do my absolute best and to show to them that I am the man I say I am. You can't become the most famous man in the world for mental resilience and God not test your mental resilience. I think that would be a very amateur way to view the world, that you can now become one of the most famous men in the world who talks about mental discipline and mental resilience and God's not going to test it. I think God's going to come along and say, okay, you want to be Mr. Famous. All right, let's see what you have. So I believed it was a, a, a chance to show God and show my ancestors and show my father that I am the man I say I am. And it's amazing how much strength you can draw from that because I don't think many men especially understand that even if you don't have the strength to be a hero for yourself, you should have enough discipline and enough honor to want to be a hero for somebody else. And if you have other people you truly respect, you should want to be a hero for them. And I think that's the masculine imperative. If, if someone's going to attack your wife, that's when you become a hero for her. You have to. What kind of man are you if you're not? And you can apply that to other things. If you apply that to your ancestors, or you apply that to God, or you apply that to your beliefs or your core principles as a man, then you can be a hero anytime you want. So it's so funny that you say that because it, it really does. It goes everything goes back to biology. I think about this all the time. No matter how much sociology is behind everything, telling men to act like women and women to act like men. At the end of the day, women want a masculine man, and, a lot, and when they don't have a masculine man and they beat their man into submission, they're not attracted to them anymore. And it's a tail in between. Yeah. It's, just, it's just not attractive anymore. And I used to <laughs> maybe think of this boyfriend that I had when you were talking about you know just defending the realm, the sort of responsibility that men have. And I, I remember sitting there realizing that I had to break up with him because I thought that if somebody burst through the door with a gun, I was going to have to be the one that would have to defend us because he was just such a flower. 100%. And it's in society is yet blaring at men to do the opposite. And I Well, think they're trying to confuse actually, us. This is why I think you have a platform. This is my whole theory that I built in my head about why you have a platform okay. is because Lena Dunham, Lena Dunham came before you, right? And I think that for years, men were told 
to act like sissies. Yep. Men were told to put your tail in between your legs. That was the message, the agreed upon message that came with, you know, Hillary Clinton running the Me Too movement. All of these things where men were basically told that if you have a masculine instinct, yep. you're guilty. Yep. And then inevitably, because there is an equilibrium in this world, yep. because there was Lena Dunham's, because there were the Taylor Swift's, because there was the girl squads, yep. eventually what would have to happen was that it was going to have to be evened out by someone saying, no, F that, be a man. Yeah, and I don't feel guilty for being a man, and I don't think any man should. No, I and don't I, think so either. And I, don't think, and I think that the most annoying thing about all of this is just how genuinely hypocritical it is. Because there's all this feminine movement, and we don't need men, and men don't matter, etc. That's Music only too many the whole it's a it's a agreed upon message that a men suck. Absolutely. And it's only in the most favorable possible circumstances where females will say that. And that's what's so disingenuous about it, because as soon as things actually begin to get hard, the closer we get to the realities of life, the closer we get to the unfortunate circumstances of the world, and they exist in many places, the faster you'll see people look for traditional masculinity to protect them. So it's not even like it's a genuine belief. That's what's so upsetting about it, is that it's just, I don't know if these people are delusional or if they're deliberately hypocritical. I'm not sure which one it is. I think but, they're brainwashed. I think it's it's a two-prong approach. I think it's 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 the cultural messaging and also in the education system. They're actively learning that this f feminism is what you need to aspire towards. Like when you get out of school, women, you should want to compete with men in climbing the corporate ladder. Yeah. I actually think there, there's a, a mass brainwash that's taking place. Well, completely. They want to neuter men. And the way you do that is you empower women to a point where they're now the dominant power, especially in the Western world. I believe we live in a matriarchy. I don't believe it's a patriarchy like we're told it is. I actually believe it's the other way around. I can't think of a single law that benefits men over women, but I can certainly think of some that benefit women over men. Mm -hmm. I think it's very dangerous to be a man in the world today. I think that if women want to destroy a man, it's extremely easy to do. We can look at my current scenario and situation I'm in, and many other men are in the same scenario. I can't think of many examples of a man falsely accusing a woman of something and her losing her entire life, where I can certainly think of ones the other way around. So, yeah, they want to turn men into eunuchs because their intention is to make us all slaves. And I say that and people, I, it rolls off my tongue and people just hear it and they don't actually think about what I'm saying. Their intention is to turn men into eunuchs because they want to make us all slaves. I want you to actually understand exactly what I'm saying to you because at the bottom line of revolution has always been young military age males and they don't want them to have enough balls or enough forward thinking, or even enough care for anything outside of themselves to do something about it. Another thing people don't understand is that a lot of these attacks and a lot of things they're trying to do with the culture, especially, they're trying to inject such innate selfishness inside of people that they don't really care about anything that happens outside of themselves. Because then it's very difficult to give a shit about your community. It's very difficult to have any kind of genuine care about your town or your country or an issue. No, they just want you to be self-absorbed, semi-depressed, because depressed people don't fight that hard watching porn, living inside of your own mind, convinced that somehow you're oppressed for some reason on the internet typing tweets. That's what they want you to do. And they're going to try and keep you there. And genuine masculinity, yeah, to a degree it's protective and to a degree also it has parameters. You, you can't be a man who doesn't say no. You can't be a man who doesn't have standards for himself and for people around him. I am got labeled as ultra misogynistic because I believe that a man should have standards in his relationship. I believe a man should avoid dishonest people, male and female. You should avoid, if you're a dishonest person, if you lie, if you're going to deceive me, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. I don't want to have anything to do with you. I was sitting and talking on a panel show saying that women who are dishonest and promiscuous are not the kind of woman I'd ever want to associate with. And I was labeled misogynistic for that. So it's, it's crazy how they'll attack you and they'll attack you so violently and so endlessly and repeat it so many times in a, in, a, in a bid to beat your soul down. That's what they want, especially from me. I truly believe I'm the number one prize for them to get. If they can get me to just give up. If we can get Andrew Tate to just give up. Being a man's bad. Come on, Andrew, say it. And it's, it's like, it's, 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 it's dangerous one thing, but it's actually genuinely also sad. When I analyze the situation in the world we're in today, I, part of me feels sad that we've ended up in this place where the people who are in charge are so evil and their plans are so so heinous and the consequences so dire that they know they can only implement them if they genuinely remove the warrior spirit from every man on the planet. Yeah. It's kind of sad. 
And the warrior spirit is really important. And it's something that I speak about a lot, that men need to go be men. Even in the capacity of my marriage, my husband needs his guy time. It's, yep. I need my girl time. Yep. Um, the masculine and feminine, it's very important. The fact that my husband hunts and shoots and does these things, that's very attractive to me. Yep. To know that if all of the grocery stores faded away, that he could go catch dinner. Absolutely. You know what I mean? That he knows how to skin an animal. Absolutely. And they poison that. Look at the hunters. Look at the way they view hunters. They look at people in the South. Yep. This is why they know how to ranch. They know how to farm. They know how to, to survive on their own, which is why they start to poison that mentality, which is why I think it's really important that you're speaking to young men about why it is okay to be a man, giving them permission to be a man in a capacity that I can't give them that permission. Uh, and in the I, same way that I try to give women the position to know that don't allow them to delude you to believing that this is femininity. It is not femininity, Lena, to have your husband offer your body to another man on camera. That's the poisoning. They they teach women that this is sexual freedom, that this is sexual liberation. Yeah. I looked at that and I saw a slave relationship. I saw a master offering his slave to an, a, another person because he was just so, oh, I just love Andrew Tate. Would you Would you like to see with my wife? I would be okay with that. That is horrific. That is not femininity. That is not masculinity. Correct. I absolutely agree with you on that point. You're totally right there. And uh, I think that's probably one of the most misogynistic things that have happened on the internet in recent times, but perhaps they're on the right side of the political spectrum. I don't know. I don't know which side they're on, but if they're on the correct side, you seem to get away with things. As you all know, faith is an essential part of my life. My family is always looking for ways to deepen our faith and to grow closer to God, and that usually begins with prayer. But it can be hard to stick to a meaningful prayer routine, which is why we love Hallow. Hallow offers a wide range of guided meditations, thoughtful prayer sessions, and daily reflections that are designed to help you connect with God on a deeper level. With Hallow, you can customize your prayer experience by setting reminders, choosing a prayer theme, and even specifying the length of your prayer session. Hallow is helping me and thousands of others to maintain a daily prayer routine that will help you too. So download the app for free at hallow.com slash Candice. Not sure where to start? Check out Father Mike Schmitz's Bible in a Year available on the Hallow app for brief daily readings and reflections. Or you can pray alongside Mark Wahlberg or Jonathan Rumi, who portrays Jesus in the popular series, The Chosen. Get an exclusive three-month free trial at hallow.com slash Candice. That's hallow.com slash Candice. Hallow, the number one Christian prayer app in the United States. But um, it's very interesting what you're saying about your husband and fishing and hunting and stuff. I completely agree with you. And there's another thing about masculinity as a whole that I don't think that a lot of people want to address, but it's something that's certainly large in terms of my following. Because if we break down, if anyone's watching this now and they're trying to understand why is Andrew Tate so popular? Well, I believe I have, I speak to the base instincts of, of base instincts, base instincts. And one of the base instincts also for men, I don't think a lot of people understand is to a degree is, is peacocking and showing off to a degree. And I do that fantastically, but um, it is. And if you look at men of old and they used to conquer and they'd wear a feather from the man they killed or they, a piece of gold they stole. There was always that degree of flexing, showing off. And I think it's being unapologetically masculine and saying, yeah, I'm a big successful man and I can afford all this stuff and this is who I am and I've worked my ass off and this is what I have and I'm not sorry about it and I've, I'm, I'm dedicated and I'm hardworking and, and no, I'm not. I don't feel like I should have to cower or hide or apologize to the world for any of these things. And I think that's the reason why a lot of men find affinity in my message. And you're right baseline masculinity is being attacked and women women naturally don't find it attractive to find a man who's not that way anyway but baseline masculinity is being attacked because they want you absolutely not only dependent on the government mm. so that the government can decide whether you eat that day and i don't want to be a pessimist but i still think in many ways almost with technological advances it's going to be very difficult to resist i think it's actually scary i don't know how the world's going to be in 100 years from now but i don't know if there's going to be much freedom left i don't no. i don't know about you but i when I look at the things they're doing with CBDCs and electric cars and the way the currency is going to change, it's going to be very difficult to resist without literally starving to death. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what's going to come. So learn to farm. Learn to learn farm. To hunt, that's right. To shoot. Don't so, let them convince you that's somehow racist and sexist and backwards and veganism. Like you better learn to do all of those things well, because we need men now more than ever, right? Yeah. And also, I do believe, and this is going to get me called misogynistic, but I'm going to say it anyway. I do believe we need masculinity, especially in the households, because I believe that women are more emotionally led and men are more logically led. It's true. And I think that the propaganda machine and the news machine primarily uses emotional arguments as opposed to logical arguments. And they, women fall for the emotional arguments. And women arguments. fall for the emotional arguments. So if you have a woman who's in charge of the household and her man can't resist her uh, commands and they put on the news, be afraid, be afraid, COVID's going to kill everybody. She gets afraid. Now you have a whole household of people with masks on 
eight vaccines mm -hmm. and down the insanity hole. Whereas a man with logic would sit there and do exactly what I did and say, look, all right, let's calm down for two minutes. Let's just, let's just wait because the news lies. So let's just wait till Wednesday before we start taking injections. It's chill. So I think also masculinity is needed because what they're going to do when they try and make us all slaves, they're going to use emotional arguments. And they're going to come along with, I was talking about COVID with somebody the other day and we were saying how insane it all was. And I said, imagine how insane something like COVID will be once the police force are robotic. Mm -hmm. Imagine once it's all AI, no mask, done. Like, at least in certain countries, and I know because I traveled the entire world doing COVID, I'll say here publicly on the internet, I broke every single COVID rule. I broke every single lockdown restriction. I broke all of them. Every single one. Never I listened to anyone. I broke more. Uh, it was a competition. Yeah. So if it's a competition, I broke more. Sure? From day one, I was like, absolutely not. I didn't even let people that were wearing masks into my house. I was like, my baby will not look up and see somebody wearing a mask in his crib. That's scary. Yeah. Looking like Bane. Look over <laughs> his crib. Like, that's just not happening. Amazing. But, um. Yeah, I mean, we, me and my brother, we moved to Sweden. We resist the COVID thing from the absolute beginning. We tried our best because Sweden was completely wide open. Mm. Absolute insanity. But yeah, even the COVID thing, if you look at it, the emotional argument that was used and how they controlled the world, and they're going to use emotional arguments to control us with everything. I talk about the police force being AI. What they're going to eventually do is say, cops shoot people, humans make mistakes, cops are racist. We're going to give you robot cops that never make mistakes because cops are racist and cops can make mistakes, but these robots never make mistakes ever. And then once all the police force are completely robotic and they've removed all our weapons, you think something like COVID 2.0 isn't coming? You think you're not going to be locked in your house? You think they're just going to, what, let you live in peace and walk around outside? Are you an idiot? And they're going to do all of this with emotional arguments. They're not That's gonna why they logic. want a matriarchy. Absolutely, because you, with a matriarchy, you can affect it with emotionality. You can sit there and say, the planet is dying. Don't you care about the trees? Give us all your money. <laughs> and people will sit there and go, oh, yeah, I do feel bad about the planet. Okay, it's just an extra 18% tax. And they can fall for it. So emotional arguments are how you get your way with anything. If you give me somebody, if you put somebody in front of me, I can convince with an emotional argument. I can convince them almost anything, almost anything. Logic is much harder to do. So we, we need masculinity even in the household. And I'm, not, I'm just talking about baseline masculinity of just the logic and the rocks, the rock solid self-assurance to sit there and say, no, I'm in charge of this house. Let's all just calm down. Let's not get emotionally led by this news channel. And let's be very smart about what we do and how we react to things. And that's why it's under attack. And I think I talk about revolutions and I talk about men being the military age males who are going to eventually stand up, et cetera. But I'm not be doomsday is about anything. I don't want to get arrested for any accusations. But even just having a masculine essence in a household makes the whole household harder to psyop. Mm -hmm. I truly believe that. And I can just think of COVID, and I use it as an example because it's the most recent large psyop they've attempted on us, where the amount of people I saved personally, I must have saved 200 people's lives from that vaccine. Me, personally, just because me as a man, they'd come to me and go, you know, I want to travel. And I'd say, listen, I don't even have time to explain to you, but have I ever been wrong? No, don't get it. Okay. A year later, they're like, I'm so glad I didn't get that. I'm like, I told you, I told you. Like, it's amazing, like, what a masculine essence can do. So that's another reason it's under attack, because if they can remove the masculine essence from society, well, now you have a society. Imagine a society where you can control purely with emotional arguments. We're almost there. We're, we're, I mean, we're, we are in a matriarchy. And this is why they accuse me of being an internalized misogynist, because I'm able to think through and acknowledge the flaws of what happens in society when women get power. And if you want to know what happens, look around you. Um, women fall for emotional arguments the entire time. They show yeah. us a commercial, you know, show us. It's so sad. And before they get to the rational aspects of it, they're already invested emotionally. Um, and I think that virtually every societal ill that we are facing today is because of women. And I think the greatest recent example of that is the Bud Light controversy because Women need to realize how backwards it is that it took men to stand up to say something was wrong when it was so obviously patently wrong. Yeah. Nobody cared for, for years until men stood up to it. So, yeah. Completely, because it's emotional arguments. And, and if we also analyze, I mean, there's certain things that women can do so much better than men. I said this the other day. I was saying to my brother, my brother had his daughter here and my niece was here. And I said, isn't it amazing? I, I found this amazing. I said, isn't it amazing the patience a mother has mm -hmm. with a toddler? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, she's been listening to Peppa Pig for four hours. I would lose my mind. I couldn't do it. I simply couldn't do it. So women have this emotionality, which is so fantastic when it's properly 
used, when it's right. put into place it's supposed to be. I would never drop my child off to a daycare full of men. Would you drop your three-year-old child to a daycare run exclusively by males? No. It'd be weird. It's just something about it is weird. I wouldn't trust the men not to lose their temper with the kid. I wouldn't understand why all these men want to be around these children all day. It would be a very weird scenario. So we all understand innately our gender roles, innately on some level. So women have a fantastic superpower when it's properly used. But like everything on earth, if you have a superpower or any kind of power at all and it's put in the wrong direction, it can be destructive. Water if it's going through a dam, can power a city. If it's not going through a dam, it's a flood. So we have all this emotionality put in the wrong direction and now they're in positions of power or whatever, or they're controlling the culture, or they're controlling how uh, households are run, and they can fall for these emotional traps, these very simple, basic emotional traps. It's for grandma. The most basic, dumb level. And I, I sit there and say, grandma's 98. 98-year-olds die. And I'm not saying she should die. I'm not saying, I'm saying 98 year olds get sick. Who said it was COVID? Prove it was COVID. She got the flu last year. Like, what? Have you lost your mind? But grandma. Which is funny because I think the average life expectancy is 73. So if they've made it to 92, they've done great. They've done great. Absolutely. And, and I said that, and people thought that that was so harsh and so mean. Because there you go harsh, mean, emotional. emotionality. Yeah. And emotionality is used against people, which is also why they don't like stoicism. It's why when you have a man who's hard to emotionally affect, they also see him as a threat. Mm -hmm. I've, I've had it from a lot of people. I've said it from, I've had some of the hate mail I've got and I, I get a lot of, I probably get about 10,000 emails a day. I'd say about 9,000 of them are support and 1,000 of them are fervent weirdos. <laughs> and the weirdos are like, you're a psychopath because all this is happening to you. You don't even care. That It's like, they're threatened by the fact that I'm stoic. They're threatened by the fact that I won't cry and lose my mind over it. They're like, oh, he has emotional control. He's a threat because then they can't lie to me. They can't sigh off me. And they want you to be emotionally incontinent. And this is another thing they're teaching men. They're teaching men to act out your feelings. Well, why are they doing that? Because that makes you an emotional person and you're easier to control. They don't care that that damages society by extension. Because when you tell men to act out their feelings, that's why you get school shooters. That's why you get rapists. That's why you get murderers. Why does somebody murder someone? Because he's mad. <laughs> He's acting out his feelings. He's not a very stoic person if he goes, I hate you, bang, right? So they're teaching all this emotional incontinence in men trying to pretend they care about society. It's destroying society in real time. They have no interest in actually preserving anything that's important about masculinity. And the only reason they're doing it is because that allows them to use emotional arguments. Now they can sit and say, okay, these men act out how they feel. So let's make them angry and they might riot. And let's make them riot on this street. Let's leave some bricks on this street. Um, you understand what I'm saying? It's all absolutely not done on purpose. And it's kind of amazing to me that nobody sits there and understands the best way you can rebel against the slave mind and resist the matrix is just to be the kind of person who uses logic, is stoic, is emotionally controlled, is physically strong because a strong body is a strong mind, who refuses to be told or labeled as something. You can't label me as a depressed person. You can't label me as some kind of disease or some kind of personality disorder. You can't label me a color. I'm Andrew Tate. This is who I am. I, I work hard for my last name. I understand what's right and wrong. I'm going to do my absolute best. And that alone in and of itself is an act of rebellion against these I people. mean, society really started going down the drain when we started getting into mental health awareness. And this is maybe one of my most controversial viewpoints, but I say it over and over on the show. Everybody needs a therapist. They're talking about their feelings. The truth is, is that every feeling you have isn't valid, doesn't need to be explored. Sometimes you just have a wacky feeling and you just let it go. And because I my grandfather was such an impact on my life, strongest man that I've ever known, didn't shed a tear um, at my grandmother's funeral. They were together from the time he was 17 years old until wow. her dying day. I'm certain he collapsed when he got home. Yeah, of course. But this traditional display of masculinity, my grandfather's perspective that a man needs to let it die in his chest, yep, yep. you know, before yep. uh, displaying this emotion had an impact on me. And when I see, like, I guess to give a cultural example, someone like Prince Harry, you know, on TV, his arms like this, breathing and showing what he learned in therapy, it makes me want to die a little. Completely. It makes me want to die a little when I see men acting like this. Completely. And that's controversial because they're supposed to say, oh my God, he's so brave. It's so stunning. Like he's showing this side of him. Everything about Prince Harry to me is what a man should not be. Right? Absolutely. D what you've done to your family, betraying your family, uh, allowing a woman to assert that much control over you that you would for profit betray your family. I mean, everybody's got a family. I, you know, everybody's got family issues. Don't even let me get started, you know, but the idea of selling out your family and then going. Uh, the royal family. The royal family. Selling out the royal family. 
And yeah. What happened? It, it's such a display of what's happened to men, what's happened to masculinity. He's giving up his guns. He's never going to do this anyway. It's all of it is such a public example of what can happen. The thing is, I know, I know what's so interesting is I know how miserable he is. He's miserable. There's no way a man can be happy in that scenario because I think masculine happiness comes from strength and to a degree excellence and also comes from respect. Mm -hmm. Men want to be respected and he doesn't respect himself. His family doesn't respect him and his woman doesn't respect him. Mm -hmm. I know how unhappy he is. I know how unhappy she is by extension. It's just an unhappy, miserable house. He gave up everything and gained absolutely and utterly nothing. This whole therapy thing, the reason I believe they push therapy so heavily is because it goes into something I said a little bit earlier about selfishness. If you convince somebody that they have to spend hours and hours per week sitting in a chair talking about that feeling they had last Thursday in the kitchen. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> it's insane. It's crazy. You, you want to talk about creating mental illness. There it is. This exasperates problems. This makes it worse. Mm -hmm. And it also builds this culture of absolute and utter selfishness. Excuse me. They're trying to put you in jail for the rest of your life effectively because they're going to enslave you and they're going to control all the money and they're going to make you get injections you don't need. Yeah, yeah, but you know, I'm sad. Uh, I got therapy. I'll talk about it later. Yeah. That's all they want. They just want you to be so obsessed with how you feel in your own mind that you can't even look outside of yourself and care about anything. Right. It's part of the propaganda machine. It's part of the mechanism to turn us all into docile farm animals. I said this to somebody the other day. They were talking about how they feel. And I said, who cares how you feel? And he goes, well, what do you mean? Well, I don't care. You're telling me I know you and I don't care. <laughs> so all the people who don't know you don't care. The woman you want doesn't care. You can't go up to a chick in a bar and say, you know what? Usually I'm really charming. Today I'm a bit sad. Can you, can you give me a pass? Can you let me off? She'll be like, go away, weirdo. The people, the chick you want doesn't care. The job you're supposed to perform at doesn't care. If the man who wants to mug you decides to pull a machete, he doesn't care. You can't say, bro, I'm not in the mood for a fight today. Tomorrow, please. Nobody cares. So why do you care? All the people out here in the world don't care, but you're going to sit there and you're going to carry me the only person in the world who cares. You're going to walk around telling everybody, trying to find somebody who gives a shit. Good luck. Because what's going to happen is you're going to walk around feeling sorry for yourself, trying to find somebody who cares. You might find somebody who pretends to care long enough for you to get a little bit of dopamine. But all in all, you're wasting time in a hyper-competitive world where people like me who perform regardless of how they feel are just going to perpetually bury you. And then you're going to sit there and wake up and go, why am I a loser? Well, because when Andrew was sad, he continued to perform. When Andrew was in jail, his business didn't fall apart. He was doing push-ups every day. His body didn't fall apart. Nothing about his life degraded when he was in a jail cell surrounded by cockroaches. You're in a plushy bed at home crying about what? And you expect to, the male world's hyper-competitive. So you're not allowed almost as a man to put that much importance on how you feel. You don't have time to care about it because you have too much to do. This is what I find so remarkable. If I feel sad, I don't think, how do I stop myself? I need to not feel sad. I just go to work. I got stuff to do. I'm a man. I have things to do every single day. This whole therapy garbage. I can't think of a way faster to ruin your mindset and destroy your ability to resist the perils of life than go into therapy. And the overdiagnoses of everything. It's like you have this, you have that. And then people take that as an excuse to not ever have to get better. Oh, absolutely. You know, it, it, now I can be permanent because I realize I've got this. I went to the doctor and the doctor says that I have this. And so that's the reason why I don't respond. I've got, I've got ADHD. I think now it's like one in every, two people has ADHD, ADHD. And that's why I'm not able to focus and do my homework or complete a task or keep going to the gym every single day. Self I hate it. It's yeah, it's a self fulfilling, fulfilling prophecy. Pro it's a self fulfilling prophecy. And I really can't think of a quicker way to destroy your mind than go to therapy. Mm -hmm. Part of me, if I had time to waste, Candace, which I don't because I've been on house arrest long enough and once I'm out of here, I'm going to enjoy myself. But if I had time to waste, I would love to go to start therapy. I would love to like, imagine me, Andrew Tate. I'm going to go to a therapist and she's not going to know who I am. And I'm going to sit there and I'm going to do therapy and I'm going to do a video. I might actually do this. It's actually a great idea. I might do a video after each therapy about what bullshit it was. <laughs> And just sitting there talking about, okay, when you were eight, yeah, what happened when you were eight? Because when, in your childhood, not everything's because of my childhood. Not, not everything works that way. Like, it's so asinine. I've actually had conversations with therapists, I think, twice in my life. I did a TV show in England, and I had to speak to a therapist. And then um, I think it was another TV show, two TV shows, I had to speak to these therapists. And I sat there and said, I don't believe in what, you, I don't believe in your science, because in math, one plus one is two. And we understand that. Whereas with what you teach, you can have a guy who doesn't drink alcohol because his dad was an alcoholic and a guy who is an alcoholic because his dad was an alcoholic. So how can you have the same scenario and two completely different outcomes? 
She goes, oh, yeah, but there's general rules we can follow. I said, then let's end the conversation. I'm not a general person. I'm not a general person. I'm exceptional. So can we just stop wasting everybody's time here? <laughs> because all your general rules don't apply to me. I'm smarter than you. What have you achieved? Goodbye. I'm a world champion. See ya. Like, it's, it's garbage. And I, I really do believe, I think there is this mass drive to instill the idea of absolute selfishness in people. I think they're trying to, when I really analyze the ideal citizen they want, the ideal citizen is, yes, docile, and yes, he's unique, but he's also ultimately selfish. Because then you don't care about community. And I think therapy is a fantastic way to make you selfish. Because that's all you talk about is, what do you talk about? Garbage. Yeah, why you have the right to act this way, even if you're why acting I terrible. Why I feel, yeah. why did I do well? You know, when I was nine, oh, I get a life. Yeah, that's really Prince Harry's book, honestly. Is it? Yeah, it's, yeah I, I could only get past the first two chapters. I was like, this is, it should have just been called privileged. You know what I mean? And this is the thing. <laughs> These aren't even struggles. And here's the thing. I, I think Margaret Thatcher said, the best upbringing you can have is good parents and no money. Because you look at Prince Harry with the, you can't talk about anything better for a perfect upbringing, royal family. Come on. It's not his fault, right? Royal family, fine. But he was supposed to have gone to the army. He went to Afghanistan and supposedly he fought, but obviously he didn't. He's the he prince. Played Xbox of course, he, played, yeah, he just yeah. sat in the back. But if you don't give a man struggle, look what he becomes. Mm -hmm. Tell me the kind of man, if I were to say to you, imagine a man who's never struggled in his life, physically, mentally, everything's gone perfect for him. Born in the royal family, everything's been perfect for him his whole life. Is that the kind of man anybody respects? Is that the kind of man anyone wants to be? And struggle is subjective, right? So Prince Harry dealing with his dealing with his current problems of his wife nagging, to him, that's full mental breakdown, right? My problems are obviously much larger, but struggle is subjective. To him, to us, they're almost on the same level. But if you were to compare them side by side, they're absolutely nothing. So as a man, you have to build resilience. And you build resilience through going through something and building a tolerance to it. And this guy's had such a privileged life that he's ended up a miserable, depressed, unhappy person. So this is what's actually very interesting. When men come to me or young boys come to me and talk about something bad that happened to him, I said, good. Absolutely, you're not really good. You should be glad that thing happened to you because that's the reason you're going to be the man who can resist the perils of life in the future. If bad things don't happen to you, you're going to end up like Prince Harry. You do want to end up like that dude, do you? No one you're, does. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> you're gonna, your life's going to be so easy, you're going to get to the end result and your wife's just going to wreck you. So you need to have all these bad things happen to you so you build the mental resilience. And that's another thing about masculinity and, and males as a whole. We're trying to take that all away from them in almost every regard. And it's kind of like, there used to be like rites of passage where a boy would become a man. That's all gone. There used to be this masculine, very healthy peer pressure to be big and strong. And that's all gone. There used to be, I mean, I don't want to use the wrong words. So I don't want to get attacked for it, but men used to consciously not pick on each other, not bully each other, but hey, well, you can't do push up You're weak. We push each other in that way. Shame each other to excellence almost. We still do it to this day in this house. Tristan's bigger than me. He's 10 kilo bigger than me. Six foot four. I'm six foot three. I'm smaller. He'll bench 160, 170 kilo. I can only bench like 150 kilo. He'll call me a for three hours. Like, that's just how we are. So I have to get up and try again. That's how men are. We've taken well, Women are too. And, and that's what I'm really against. Sorry to cut you off, but I'm super against this, this parenting structure where you don't want anybody's feelings to get hurt. I'm one of three sisters. We're a year and a half apart. We tried to kill each other. You know what I mean? All I would do is call my sister. No one has called her uglier more. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm like, yeah. you're ugly. You're this. You're fat. Da, 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 da. That's actually good. Yep. You know, it, it makes you tougher. And when you see these only ch children who've yep. never gone through anything, their parents told them they were perfect and wonderful. Yep. And I'm thinking, I wouldn't trade my childhood trying me and my sister's trying to kill each other you know every single day life's difficult over a t-shirt yeah you know? and, and it doesn't matter how much money you have life is always going to be difficult it doesn't matter how much you try and shelter your children how rich you are what family they're born into life is going to be difficult and if there is no struggle in their life they're going to find struggle or something that shouldn't be a struggle will become a struggle for them because their life has been so sheltered and life is hard mm -hmm. so if you can't avoid the difficulty you may as well get very good at it you may as well get good at difficulty and it's amazing when you look at someone like Prince Harry, he's just a man who has not become very good at difficulty and he's just completely collapsed in the face of a woman who's complaining at him. And yeah, the, even worse than all that, the dishonor of, of selling out. We were talking about how I feel a duty to my bloodline and my last name and I have to do my father proud. He's from the British royal family. Like, and he had no honor. He couldn't even sit and say, to, look, listen. He couldn't I, even shut up for them. Yeah, literally. He had to sell out in a book. Like, God does not smile favorably on people who make these kind of decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why he's going to be unhappy for a very long time. And he's going to realize that it was never worth it. And what did he do it for? Money? money. From the royal family, my friend. You really need money that bad? Like, it's, it's truly shameful. And I think deceit and treachery are the most heinous and most disliked 
personal qualities or something you can actually witness somebody do. I think everybody hates them. And it's because anybody can fall victim to them. Anybody can fall victim to deceit yeah. or treachery because you trust that person. Everybody trusts someone, right? So that person turns on you, you're always in trouble. So I think he, he thinks that he has the populace on his side. But I don't think he understands that when you out yourself as a snake, everybody intrinsically dislikes you. Mm. Even if they enjoyed watching the show. Oh, completely. They've stepped away and went, okay. Because I, I gave the example on my show. You know, you have the Kardashian family. and But the one thing about them is they, they're thicker than thieves. So America does like a reality show, yeah. right? They like a reality show. But the reason why they have gained popularity is because actually they always back each other up. Yeah, yeah. They, they still remain a family unit. 100%. And when you betray that, when you betray family, I think left and right, you just kind of go, okay, maybe. Maybe that was a little too much. Yeah. It was fun to watch. It was fun to watch. But, but mm, we don't really trust you. I don't want to be your friend. Yeah, I don't want to be your <laughs> yeah, friend. I don't want to be your friend. <laughs> yeah, completely. I mean, you're going to sell your own brother out? What am I to you? Right? If you do that to your own brother, what am I to you? Absolutely crazy. And then he wonders why. And I also think what he probably doesn't understand, and if he's watching this, you never know, he might. Hello, Harry. <laughs> if he's watching this, I don't think he even understands that even his woman views him that way. Mm -hmm. Even Megan views you that way. Even Megan looks at you and goes, I complained at you over William. And you were supposed to tell me to be quiet, and you didn't. So now I think you're a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> now what? Uh, and you wonder why she's never happy. So now he's in big trouble. I don't know what he's going to do with his life, but he's in big trouble. But it's kind of, it's interesting where I don't see how. It's actually an interesting conversation to have about how psyops can work as a whole. Because when I analyze, especially as a man, and I always talk from the masculine frame, not because I'm a misogynist, but because I'm a man. And I understand the masculine frame because I am a man. If you stray from the, the archetype of masculinity, if you stray from honor, courage, if you're not dutiful, if you don't believe in putting honor in your last name, if you don't want to be physically and mentally strong, if you don't believe in finding problems to solve, you don't believe in having a difficult life, if you stray from this because you've been psyop to stray from it, all you end up with is misery. And it's amazing that people will see anybody who's strayed from it end up perma-miserable and still fall for the psyop. I, I find it incredible that people don't think logically long enough to sit and say, okay, Whose life do I actually want? I would never adopt the thinking of somebody whose life I didn't want. I, I don't know why people even do that. I could sit and have a conversation with Prince Harry for 10 hours straight, and he could be as compendious and convincing and concise, and, and he could be extremely perfectly articulate with his points. And at the end of it, I'd say, yeah, but I don't want to be you. So I don't want to think like you. So get fucked. Yeah. But uh, I wouldn't want to listen to him. So... I, I don't know why people don't even just wake up and go, okay, whose life do I want to live? What kind of person do I want to be? Who do I want to be like? That's the kind of thinking I need to adopt and install in my mind because we're all being programmed by someone to a degree. And I don't think you can escape programming. You can just choose the programming that you are going to install inside of your mind. I'm not going to sit and say I'm not programmed. My father programmed me. My fight coach programmed me. The friends I have around me programmed me. My brother programs me. My social circle programs me. We're all programmed to a degree. You have to be very careful with who you're going to allow give you the programming. Because if you put it up to society and culture, the current culture, as a man, you're going to end up like Prince Harry. Do you want to be Prince Harry? It's a That's, big question. It's a big question. And the answer is no. Yeah, the answer is no. <laughs> It's interesting what you said earlier about putting things back to biology, because a lot of human nature is certainly animalistically biolog biological. And even if we look at Harry and Meghan and how they interact in their home, I obviously don't know. But I can almost guess to the T the arguments they're having. I can imagine him saying, I gave up my family for you. you this is what you wanted. I gave you what you wanted. Why, why, why aren't, aren't you happy? I gave you everything you liked. And he's trying to use a logical or an emotional, well, he's trying to use an emotional argument, but it ain't going to work because she doesn't respect him. But he's trying to use a logical argument with her, trying to understand why she treats him so badly after he completely and utterly complied. But humans are biological, and she, as a woman, wanted him to be a man. She wanted him to have some degree of parameter and barrier. And if you don't put up any parameter or barrier as a man, what a woman's going to do is she's going to push you and push you and push you and push you. She's going to see how far she can push you. That's the reality of it. We can talk about any relationship whether it's Mary and, uh, sorry, Harry and Meghan or any other relationship, if you're a full-grown man and you don't set parameters or set barriers, the woman's going to push you and push you and push you until she eventually finds one. Mm -hmm. And we can also, we can look at that in a romantic relationship, but also people. People in general, if you're going to give to a taker, they're going to take and take and take and take until you eventually say no. That's how humans work. So she was waiting for him on a biological level to stand up and be a man and say, listen, you've joined the royal family. You're right. You had to bow to the Queen of England. Correct. Because it's the royal family. Get over it. That's what that's all he had to do. He could have saved himself all this mess. 
But he could have saved himself all the running away and looking like a fool and the upcoming divorce and all this garbage if he would have just put his foot down. He never did. And she was trying to inspire in him the warrior. I think a woman sometimes tests a man to say, okay, how much will he put up with? Because they want to see, are you a man or not? What if, a, what if a man's giving you shit? What will you do? They want to see if you're about it. And she was just testing him and he failed every time. And that's why he's tried to perma-please her. And now he's in a situation where he's asking her while she, why she's unhappy when he's given her everything she wants. And she's unhappy because you gave her everything she wants because you're a punk. Women don't want neutered men. They don't. Absolutely. Even if they Even if they personally neuter them themselves, it's not what they want in the end. So I'll ask the question, what do you think men want in women? That's a really good question. And I can answer that one easily. I think that the masculine realm that we operate in is based on respect. I think that men are constantly looking for a way to be respected. I think the world is hyper competitive and we're constantly always looking for status amongst our peers. This is why you will see a man give up his basically entire life to do something which will only gain him respect, even in a very small sphere. There are CEOs who go to work every day and don't even see their family and give up their entire life and work 12 hour days just to feel like the man in that office. Feeling important in that one office, in that one skyscraper is worth him giving up his life because he feels like he matters. And if he gets more respect in that office than he does at home or anywhere else, that's where he's gonna wanna be. Men function on that. So if I had to build the ideal woman who could get any man on earth. What she would have to do is understand that I need to give my man as much status and as much respect as possible. I, by extension of him, being next to him, need to make him look respected. And a lot of this is the easy things we know. No one's going to respect a man who's with an ultra promiscuous woman. No one's going to respect a man who's with a woman who is back talking him or horrible to him in public. No one's going to respect a man who's with a woman who clearly isn't interested in him sexually, whatever. That's all the obvious part. But the hidden actual message behind all of it is that men are constantly looking for status and respect. And a woman who makes her man feel respected, not only from her, but from his peers, is the kind of woman a man's never going to want to lose. Right. So if I had a woman and I came home with all five of my friends and she came in the house and said, came in the room, who's hungry? Anyone want any food? It's not about food. I'm the G now. I'm the big boss. My woman wants to feed all of us. Of, of the guys there, most of their chicks won't, we would never do that. That's respect, that's status for me. That elevates my status. So I think as a woman, if you truly, if you're watching this and you want to keep a man happy, you need to wake up and say, how can I improve the status of my man to his peers? How can I make him look more important to the world? Mm -hmm. And as long as you take that basic mental frame, you can extrapolate that out to anything. Your man's not going to feel high status and important if you've had a whole bunch of sexual partners because you're promiscuous. So obviously that's the down, so that's no. He's not going to feel high status and important if you belittle him in front of his friends or you argue with him in front of his friends. He's not going to feel high status and important if you disagree with him on small minor issues about, if he votes one way, just vote the same way. Like th these small, th voting's not a small thing, but these things make the man look in charge, it increases his status, and that's what he's most interested in a woman. So that's what men are looking for. For the whole, that's the secret for the women who are out at home. They're so going, men are hard to please. No, men are actually very simple to please. Make him feel important and make him look important. That's it. Since when did we decide to stop upholding free speech as a basic right? Obviously, everyone should have the right to express themselves freely. Sadly, the big tech monopoly has instead opted for silencing tactics and censorship. To fight back against big tech's control of the internet, I use ExpressVPN. Ever wondered how free to access tech companies can make all of their money by tracking your searches, video history, and everything that you click on? By building a profile on you and then they sell off all of your sensitive data. When you use ExpressVPN app on your computer or your phone, you anonymize much of your online presence by hiding your IP address. That makes your activity more difficult to trace and sell to advertisers. Protect your data today at expressvpn.com slash Candice. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash Candice to get three months free. Visit expressvpn.com slash Candice to learn more. So both of us come from families. My parents are divorced. Your parents were divorced. Yep. I think your parents maybe lasted a little longer than my parents. I'm not totally positive. What was your mother like? I don't think I've learned, learned anything about her. Yeah. So I had a fantastic mom. She did what a mother was supposed to do. I guess I was raised in a hyper, I call it hyper traditional. The modern world will call it mask. We'll call it misogynistic household. My father was in charge. It was his household. My mother was in charge of feeding us and clothing us and sending us to school. And she did a fantastic job. I think that as a boy, as, as a man, I always wanted to emulate my father. My father was the superhero. So my father instilled a lot of the mindset that I have, but my mother did a lot of the basic things that kept me alive. 
if, if that makes sense. Um, she was a fantastic mom and she's still alive today and I love her very much. One of the first things I did when I got rich was retire her completely. So she is one of the people I take care of and I'll take care of her for the rest of her life. And she did the absolute best she could. And uh, that's the reason we moved to England. They decided to get divorced and England has a, more, a better social care system. We, okay. had no, we had no money. So uh, we got moved to England and I grew up in Luton, which is the worst town in England, in an area called Marsh Farm, which is the worst area <laughs> of the worst, it, town. the worst town. So it's like as bad as you can get, like the worst place you can possibly go. I think my school had a 4% pass rate or something ridiculously low. So I grew up in a really bad area. But my mother, yeah, she was fantastic. And she did the absolute best she could. And uh, she always loved my father to the end. But I think my father, in many ways, almost, there's certainly been a lot of circumstances where he sacrificed his marriage to raise us in a very particular way. Because mm -hmm. he, he, my mother and father would argue most over the raising of me and Tristan because my dad was so hard on us. Mm. But he said, look, you boys are, my legacy are more important than arguing with your mother. So I think that's actually why they broke up because he was so hard on us. Mm. But um, I thank him for it. So yeah, but I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to disrespect my mother, my mother by saying there isn't much more to say besides the fact she was a very nice, very loving, very attentive mother. That's what she did. Mm -hmm. And But my dad was always my superhero. Right. And I, I, I don't and, know what else to say. My dad was my superhero. Well, I see it now. My son's only two and he just, he's now toddler terrorist, wakes up every day, wants to go to war. I don't want to go to war. I just want to love him. Yeah. And so he just, he is obsessed with my husband. I mean, forget it. The second my husband walks through the door, it's like, I don't even exist, right? Yep. Forget the fact that I held him for 10 months. And just, <laughs> I don't exist. But unless he's sick. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, then it's like totally mommy, mommy, mommy. Oh, completely. I'm like, yeah. oh, okay, okay. So when you want to go to war all day and you're feeling great, it's like, dad, he literally just wants to fight him. He just he goes up and he hits him and he wants him to be thrown around and I don't want to do it. I'm like, you're yeah. kind of big. Yeah. I don't want to toss you around. Go find your father. Yeah. Um. So there actually is a natural proclivity that goes on there too, where like in the way he acts when a man walks through the door, any man, by the way, yeah. he, he, my son wants their attention. He, you, you can see that he seeks their approval at the age yeah. of two. He wants to be, he'll cry in front of the girls, you know, yeah. uh, well, it's me, it's my assistant. If it's girls, he's putting on. Then when the guys are there, he's much more. He instantly stops the crying and stops the tears. So it's, it's so interesting to watch that and examine that. With just a two-year-old. So well, that's biological, about, right? This is how we charge at the gunfire. This is how men charge at the gunfire because we want the respect of our peers. We will literally commit suicide for the respect of our peers. Like it's something that's deep inside of us, or it used to be, it should be. Mm -hmm. They're trying to take it away from us. But how do you get men to go over the trench, over the line and charge at machine guns? Well, you do it because everyone else is doing it. And you don't want to be the only bitch, so you have to do it. And you have to die. Like that doesn't make sense. Think about it logically. It doesn't make any sense logically, but it's something biological inside of all of us because we have this innate feeling of duty and honor and that's where the courage comes from. And they're trying to destroy that along with everything else. But you're right, this is how men biologically uh, are designed to be. And I was the same when I was young. I remember looking at my dad just going, you're a superhero and I want to be a superhero. Mm. That's just how, that's how it was. So, uh, but yeah, my mother's fantastic and I love her very much and she's very proud of me and she's very proud of how we were raised and she's so glad we were strong. Like even when we were in jail, she was very concerned, but she's like, look, I know that if anyone can do it, you can do it. And uh, yeah, so. Do you want to be married? Good question. I heard it's that's the lover boy tactic. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but. Yeah. And that's an interesting question oh. because younger me, Younger me would say no, absolutely not. And, and the reason younger me would say no is because I'd come up with all the arguments that there's no legal advantage really, and the woman can wreck you, and you can lose all of your things, etc. What's the point? I don't want the government involved in my life, all those kind of arguments. But as I get older, maybe I'm getting a bit softer. Maybe I do think sometimes you need to make a decision based purely on love and have the faith of of love and faith in your love enough to to say, I don't care what the government's going to do about this because I truly believe in us and I think we're going to make it. Yeah. So would I get married? Perhaps some point, yes, in the future I might get married. Yeah, I, I, I'm not against marriage like I used to be. I used to be super against it. And I think that's because I grew up in an environment where everybody was divorced. Everyone. So it's like, well, what's the point in this? Oh, wait, so I give her half my stuff and then what? What? No, I, don't, I didn't understand the whole point of it. But now I think if I met the right woman, perhaps, yes. Yeah, marriage is, is good. Yeah? If it's, if it's the, convert, convert me, Kendra. Yeah, if, convert. It, if it's the right person, if you married the right person, and I'm saying this as someone who grew up with divorced parents, um, well, they got to, they got divorced after I was out of the house, but it, and this gets is, speaks to your earlier point about it either impacts you one way or the other. You either yeah. want marriage because your parents were divorced, yeah. you don't want marriage. I desperately wanted marriage. And I think the ways in which we both have grown, yeah. 
um, and the confidence that it gives you. I think there is something about people are like, how do you do what you do every day? Because you cannot impact. My life is so stable. The yeah. nucleus of our household is so stable. And to be able to raise kids and have them see that example of the perfect yin and the yang, yeah. there's something divine about it. There's something spiritual about it. It's why I won't accept you. I think you are actually a libertarian right now, and I won't accept you as a libertarian. I think you will not be one. In a few years, if I had to make a prediction, I think you will lean towards conservatism because even in just the crack of you talking about the attack on masculinity, because first you say, oh, well, if everyone wants to do what they want to do, if you guys all agree and you want to be homosexuals, fine. But then we'll start to realize that that libertarianism, live and let live, is what welcomes in through the door. I'm, you know, very against every every ill that homosexuality has brought. Yep. And again, these are two, these are consenting people yep, that are doing what they want to do. This is true. But look, evil is evil, sin is sin, and we're yesterday talking about homosexual marriage. Today we're talking about trans. Well, it's children. such a slippery slope. It's, this is the thing, right? You're completely right because the idea of live and let live was a fantastic one if it could actually operate without slippery slopes and it descending into can- chaos and can't. anarchy and it can't. Mm-mm. So this is the difficult thing about it. You get called a bigot for saying this is my line. I don't agree with this and you're going to be called bigoted and you're going to be attacked. But truthfully, it's just understanding that like you're saying, it's a slippery slope. Yeah. And uh, it's unfortunate. So what, what is the slope that we want then? Okay, then we should aspire towards heterosexual relationships. We Correct. should aspire towards marriage. We should, Correct. And this is this is the mold that I am selling all the time. Wouldn't have said this 10 years ago. I was probably more libertarian when I first got into politics. And, oh, what's the big deal if people want to do this to themselves? Yeah. And then I realized, no, they're... There is a reason. Yeah. Um, no, and you're completely right. And the reason I gave that example is because I'm currently in a legal jeopardy where, or a legal situation where people who have nothing to do with our, my life are trying to say that people were victims when they weren't, when everyone was consenting. And you're right. I agree with you there. I also think with the whole LGBT argument, it's interesting because I will be honest and say I do think there is a difference between G and T. I think they are different of course, things. Of course. I think they're massively different things. However, you're right. It's a shame. It's such a slippery slope where you can't just say to people, live and let live, because it's going to be hijacked and Trojan horsed. Mm-hmm. And they're going to Trojan horse it and they're going to inject something in it that destroys the lives of every single person on the planet. Mm-hmm. And they're going to try and do it. So you have to draw a hard line. You have to be a bigot. You have to never give an inch because if you give an inch, they take 10 miles. That's more than 10 miles. Look at, I mean, look at where we're at. I mean, you're- It, it, none of it makes any sense, and but it's, these are real evils that we're fighting today, <coughs> and I think it's because we haven't put those firm lines in the sand and said, no, actually, there is such a thing as right and wrong. Oh, well, this is the thing I love about, and this is where religion comes in, right? Because right. I used to be an atheist. Mm-hmm. And then you, exactly what you just said about there's something divine about marriage, and exactly like you said, there's such a thing as sin. Everything you're talking about is religious. You're completely correct. You eventually, if you're going to wake up and be the kind of person who has hard parameters and said, this is right, this is wrong, it's very difficult to do that without then turning and understanding that has to come from God. Who who else is going to decide what is right and what is wrong? And people say, oh, they're all man-made religions. Well, then why does it go against so many of the wills of man? Some of the sins that man want to go and do, the religions are against. If we made a religion, a religion wouldn't be against our own sins, would it? Right. So... It's 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 interesting that this is almost proof for God in so many ways when you're going to wake up and realize that there is genuine evil in the world and there's genuine good in the world and there are two sides and two camps. And I do believe that the good is on the side of truth and I do believe that comes from God. And there's many different ways to God. I think there is one God and there's different religions and I don't want to argue the, the differences to, between the religions because I think we have a lot more in common than we have, uh, especially in the fight against evil, than we have as differences. But yeah, it's super interesting and you're right. Firm lines are absolutely not really required, and and if we don't have them, it's why societies ends up in the position it's in, with so many subjective lines and your truth, my truth, the truth, or and you're and you're completely correct. It's not very often I sit with somebody who I feel like says something and I feel corrected, but you're right. Live and let live is hijacked. Yeah. It's hijacked, and it's unfortunate that me as a person now, especially, and I, I, maybe this is a personal, maybe this is more of a personal thing. Maybe this is more of a personality trait where I'm in the position I'm in, I'm saying what I believe is the truth and I'm out here trying to help people and I'm saying about the difficulties I went through in my life so others don't have to go through them, just as you said. But if somebody doesn't want to listen to me, I'm like, okay, you don't want to listen to me, I don't care. You do what you want. But that live and let live 
mind frame can be hijacked because when I'm saying to people, okay, don't do what I want or don't do what I believe to be good. Don't do what God believes to be good. Do what you want. I don't care. And then they get in a large enough group and they end up attacking morality. It redefines, yeah, normalcy. It redefines morality. And, you know, I recently was sitting on having a conversation with a friend of mine, Brandon, and I, when I first got into politics, I wasn't so staunchly against homosexual marriage. I didn't speak out on certain things, yeah. abortion. And then I saw it firsthand. I would, I, I just examined just the differences in my relationships with heterosexual couples and homosexual couples and homosexual couples. I'm talking about two men. You don't realize that God designed a, a man to be with a woman because it prevents men from giving, uh, from giving entirely into the worst components of who men are. Sex, just having sex women are all the time. Yeah, women right? Are you can't do that. If you're with a woman, yeah. okay, maybe it's menstruation, maybe it's pregnancy, maybe yeah. it's afterbirth, yeah. but there are these natural barriers that make it so that your relationship has to be about something else other than just sex. Yeah. When I'm with my homosexual friends, they talk about sex. They, I don't think they realize that heterosexual couples don't just sit down for lunch and be like, we banged 20 times last night because yeah. we could. They think that that's normal. Sure. So then you talk about how that bleeds into pornography. That bleeds into wanting to talk about sexuality in the classroom, how that might bleed in to suddenly wanting to speak to children about sex and go, oh, this is all normal. It's actually not normal, but because it's normal in a homosexual relationship, you think that it's actually normal. Totally right. And so I have suddenly realized and this is why I become so staunchly conservative, how it all bleeds into everything. And there is such a thing as objective rightness and there is such a thing as objective wrongness. Completely correct. And I agree with absolutely everything you just said. So my question would be then, what do we do? Do we force everybody to be Christians or force everybody to be religious or how do we do it? Well, I think the first thing is having the courage to talk about it. And, and, and nobody even talks about these topics anymore because they just go, oh, they've won. So we need to let this go. And, and more and more you're seeing culturally people are afraid of being canceled. I mean, what I just said to you is grounds for a cancellation. How dare you question this? How yeah. dare you? I even believe now after seeing the ways in which society has made children believe that they're all trans. I didn't, I didn't, I went to university. I went to high school. I didn't graduate with a single trans person. Now you want me to believe one in four children suffers from identity issues? Yeah. No. No, that's socialization. Completely. You place that on them. So is it such a far stretch to imagine that the same happened in the homosexual when homosexuality came to America and then we popularized it and we put Helen on Ellen on TV and we gave Melissa Etheridge a platform and suddenly pride parades were happening everywhere. Whereas you don't see this here. You don't Completely. you don't see this here in Romania where Completely. we're sitting. Because we haven't this is the power of culture. This is the power of pop culture. When you make something, yeah. you have to go the other way. Completely. You need to normalize it. You need to, you need to say, actually, this is abnormal. Absolutely. And this is what normal is. And it's not both. So yeah, I've become very conservative in all of these perspectives. I, you're completely correct. You nailed it. When I, when I, I said, do we force everyone to be Christian? You nailed it by changing the ex exact thing I was going to say. It's about culture. It's a cultural issue. And it's completely utterly correct. And I think that's actually one of the reasons why I mean, I don't state this with arrogance. I don't want people to understand. I'm not trying to be arrogant. I'm trying to make people understand the situation I'm in. I was the most Googled man on the planet at one point. So I had a massive impact on the culture and it was dragging in the complete opposite direction that the culture wants to move in. Mm -hmm. I'm dragging men in the complete opposite direction that the Satanists and the people who want to turn us all into slaves want us to go in. So I think that anybody who sits at home and realizes that my legal troubles appearing basically directly after that is a coincidence, then you're awfully naive. So it's it's unfortunate also that the way the world works, at a certain level of influence and power, the justice system almost breaks down. We see that even in America and most other countries, it all just becomes a big game and a big show, and it's about power plays and a whole bunch of conversations behind the scenes. It's not about justice anymore. So it's very, it's very concerning because you are right. We are in a culture war. And it's culture which is absolutely not only defining the direction in which we move. And this is one of the reasons why. I reverted to Islam because I feel like the Islamic culture is the strongest. You feel the culture. I was you wondering feel because it. you were Christian and, you know, I definitely do not know enough about the Islamic faith to sit here and debate you on it. Yeah. I'm never a person that will debate somebody on something that I'm not an expertise on. Yeah. But I will say that I'm sad that you're not a Christian anymore because I, and I, I can sense perhaps it's because you felt that Christians weren't doing a good job defending their beliefs? Yeah, I think that God should be feared. I believe that God should be feared. I fear God. Mm -hmm. It's one of the only things I fear. And I believe that also you see God to a degree or you see religion how you see yourself. And I see myself as a person of strong principles and strong morals. And I like to think of myself as the kind of person nobody really wants to cross, not because I'm a psycho, but because I'm a man of capability and I'm smart and I'm strong and nobody wants to make an enemy of me. So I feel like I find an affinity to a belief system which has very similar outlooks. And 
There's a whole bunch of other things I can say from the Quran and Islamic texts, etc. But to keep it very vague and very broad for people who are not Islamic, I felt God when I was in an Islamic country. If I went to an Islamic country, the problem. I the felt West, God. West you don't feel any God. How is it a Christian country if Satanists are mocking Jesus on the streets? Okay. I, uh, I, I I understand what you're saying. And I, I was trying to gather in my head what made him pulled him away from Christianity. And I said, it's probably the example. If you're thinking that America is a Christian country and you're thinking that the United Kingdom is a Christian the country, country, they're not, they're and you're not. Going, Christianity is getting it wrong. Yeah. And the truth is that America is no longer a Christian country. We're being run by people that are satanic. Hollywood is satanic and right. Hollywood is running America. Right. So you're not wrong. But I think that right now America is facing a spiritual battle. And for yeah. the first time, in a very long time, Christians are starting to stand up and speak about our principles. I hope so. And, and I could have used you <laughs> as a I, I, I know. Christian. But I, I have seen in California, I've seen Christians and Muslims get side by side when they were complaining about the LGBT yeah, I did see in that schools, which recently. is fantastic. And I know what you're saying, and that is true. But it's almost like when I go to an Islamic country, I feel God around. I You see it. You see it in the way the, the people are dressed. You see it in the fact that everyone's in a family. You see it in the fact that there's a mosque on every corner. It's in the air. And it's almost like when I'm in Dubai and I'm talking to my friends, my Islamic friends, and I explain to them the things you have to protect your child from in an American school, they, they literally think I'm lying. They're like, no, surely. Like, th th it's mind-bending to what them. What about African countries that are Christian? Okay, so yeah, this is interesting. So Yeah, they still are mind-blown by the concept of what we're fighting in America. So America is unique. We shouldn't say that this is the You're right. blanket. You're right. They're right. There are Christian countries which still take Christianity. And they're like, seriously. what do you mean men can be women? Like, they think you're crazy. And we're in Romania. And Romania is a country which is Christian. very conservative and very Christian. Very Christian. And they don't buy into any of this garbage no, either. none of it. So this is absolutely not really true. It's unfair to say all Christian countries are like America that. is an exception and not, not in a good way. Yeah. I think they're like the whole West is, unfortunately. The West, like, the West is, I, I've said on my show the entire time, the West is falling. The fact that we're even having these debates is, yeah. is not good. Yeah. The West has fallen and unfortunately- Russia. Yeah. Christian country. Yeah, absolutely. A very Christian country. So yeah, you you are right. But I I felt an affinity to Islam. I felt God in the air and it's it's difficult for me to explain any other way. Okay, that's fair enough. I, I won't push you any further on that. All right, let's get to your case that's happening today. So, and, and why conservatives are screaming about it in America yeah. and why they feel that Tucker didn't push you enough on this case. Push me. Okay. So first and foremost, one thing I want to clarify for people that are watching this is that... There seems to be this understanding that you are being prosecuted or you're being indicted rather for human sex trafficking charges. I've read the indictment and I do want to make it clear the words human sex trafficking occur on the indictment, but then it very makes it very clear that what they're referring to is they kind of extended the term. It's not what we think about in America when you think of a bunch of children being put into yeah. a truck and taken over the border against their will. They're basically saying that if you, if you trick a woman into coming into a country by using the lover boy method, then they consider that to be human sex trafficking. So the definition has definitely expanded over time. Well, it's also ridiculously misogynistic to believe that women can't make their own decisions on anything. So the whole thing about it is misogynistic. But yeah, you're correct. That's a very important distinction. Essentially, what they're saying is we have a show in America called 90 Day Fiance. Yeah. That is the lover boy method, is women yep. that <laughs> then come over to the U.S. Yep. They're clearly coming for citizenship, but these women kind of get duped and they get, they sponsor these people. Yep. This would be the same vein of what they're trying to describe. I've read it myself of what human sex trafficking can be, which is oh, it's an a woman reach. fell for you, fell in love, moved over here overseas, but it's only because you were very convincing. Yeah. That is the definition given in the indictment of what they're referring to. Correct. So I, I'll give a very quick rundown on the case. Everything from these old videos, old clips, my webcam company, things that happened 10 years ago have absolutely nothing to do with the correct case. Absolutely zero. Anything you see from before 2021 has nothing to do with the case. The case against me is that from 2021, my brother and I, when we were already worth hundreds of millions of dollars and already successful and famous, created an organized criminal group. And our intention was to convince women to move to Romania to make TikTok videos so we could steal the TikTok money. And TikTok, and they mention OnlyFans. Correct. On the indictment page. And they say that you did this using the lover boy method. Yeah. And it almost reads, what's interesting to me and why I was compelled by this case is just that because they tremendously changed it when they were investigating you 
we were told that there was a woman who went to the UN who escaped yep. the, your grip and that, you know, she said, I've been held captive. Yep. And then after they investigated, they came up with what it sounded like regurgitated Andrew Tate videos. Yep. The lover boy method, which is in one of your videos wh where you're talking about women. So it, it seems like during that time where they held you in the cell, perhaps the initial case that they fed to the media fell apart. Yeah, I believe what happened, and I have to be very careful what I say, but what I believe happened is in April of last year, Tristan and I had some visitors here from America who were only in the country for five days, made some very strange demands financially. When they were rejected, they called the American embassy and said right. they had been kidnapped. Those two women, we deem now to be professionals. One of them has accused seven men of kidnapping in her life. And she's also lawyered up instantly from a left-wing NGO because she's currently being sued by us for false charges. And she seemed to be very well supported and funded. So I don't know if she was sent as an agent. We're not entirely sure. So this is a very interesting beginning to all of this in April. The Romanian authorities arrested us for precisely two hours and threw it out and knew it was all garbage from the beginning. The case remained open. Nobody understood why the case remained open. My lawyer made repeated requests to close the case. They wouldn't close the case and it remained open and absolutely not really dormant. When I was canceled, when I was deleted across all social media and canceled and lost my bank accounts, my Uber account, my Stripe account, my Gmail, absolutely everything, it literally within the same week, the case was picked back up, which is very strange. I was followed. They tried to find evidence of any kind of crime at all. They couldn't find any crimes whatsoever. They then raided my house for a second time with the intent of getting my electronics, which they got. They went through all of my electronics and they could find nothing of actual criminal intent. What they did find is my brother and I and our personal assistant, because at the time, if anyone who knows on the internet or has been around for a while will remember, my face was all over TikTok. You could not get rid of my face on TikTok. Me and my brother were explaining our strategy for how we got so big on TikTok to some friends of ours. They then said that we were forcing them to do the TikToks for our money, for our brand. They made this huge reach and said it's human trafficking because we're forcing women to make TikTok videos. Yeah, so that's the part that registered to me as strange. It started as a kid. We were told it was kidnapping, which is quite it's very serious yeah. that somebody fled to the U.S. embassy. This is the woman that you're talking about that you yeah. say uh, you're alleging has also accused seven other men. Alleging, it's 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 literally now on Twitter. You can see the file, uh, the complaint we have filed against her. Seven men she is accused of kidnapping. She's done it with seven different boyfriends who didn't buy her what she wanted. One of them killed himself. Okay, wow. So she's a, prof she's a professional. Okay, so it's very strange that she she comes over, she accuses you of kidnapping her, but then they decide not to prosecute that. But they they fed that to the media that you kidnapped someone. That she fled to the U.S. embassy. Yep. Then all of a sudden we learn that they're investigating you, and the charges then go from kidnapping to well, actually, what he was doing is a lover boy method, which we're saying is human sex trafficking, yep. and that these women didn't know what he what they were getting into. They thought that he was going to marry them. Yep. And actually what he wanted them to do was just to make TikTok and OnlyFans videos. Yeah. So the lover boy method, traditionally, the way it would traditionally work, the reason it was criminalized and added to the criminal code is that I would be a Romanian man and I would meet a Romanian girl. We would get married. Marriage is part of it. I'm not married to anybody. We'd get married. We'd move to a richer country. You go from a poor country to a rich country, let's say America. You put the girl into sexual work, let's say prostitution, and then I'll keep all the money and I'll, I'll control her or coerce her by, by pretending to love her. That's what they're saying. That's how it traditionally works. Mm -hmm. They've accused me of using the lover boy method because basically I was a nice person. I was nice. That's the thing that so uh, most people don't understand about the law. It's so ridiculously subjective. If they want to weaponize it and use it to attack you, that's exactly what they'll do. They can accuse any man of using the lover boy method if you send nice messages on a text message. If you're like, hey, baby, how are you? So did you, <laughs> hey, did, you, you promise, nice. did you promise to marry these women? No, I didn't promise to marry anybody. What I had was girls, the two girls who were in the criminal file, asked me how to be famous on TikTok. I told them how to be famous on TikTok, and I spoke to them nicely the entire time. These two women have come out and made videos repeatedly saying, we're not victims of anything. I don't know if you've seen them. No. Okay, so, you're, so just so I back this up. The victims. The victims in the indictment. Correct. Have made videos correct. saying we're not victims. Correct. I did not know that. It's, there, it's all over Twitter. In fact, on my, I think it's my pinned tweet, you can see the criminal case against Andrew Tate. The two victims who the DCAR are accusing me of using Loverboy method on have made videos saying, he just told us how to do social media. We're not victims. I've never seen any of them being aggressive or rude. They've always respected, respected people. I forced them in inside them. No, no. Suntem prieteni buni de 
Doi ani de zile, cam așa, a fost să mă treci pe mine ca și victimă, dacă eu n-am spus că sunt o victimă. They gave this statement to the police. The police ignored it and said they're brainwashed. So they ignore it. So now we have a criminal case where we have girls who are saying they're not victims of anything. Me telling girls how to make money on TikTok, or not even how to make money, because no one makes money on TikTok, telling them how to get famous on TikTok, and them saying that I forced them for money, which doesn't exist. There's no money in the criminal file. There's no transactions. There's no financials, nothing. The girls themselves have given statements in my defense. They're being thrown away so they can continue with this case saying that I've brainwashed the women. So now we have, imagine in court, my brother and I and the two victims all on the same side saying nobody's done anything wrong. We're all friends. We were talking about TikTok accounts. Mm -hmm. And then you have the state with no witnesses on its own saying you're victims and you're bad and you're going to jail. So it seems like what they're doing then is this is where the content from 10 years ago is coming into play, where they're saying, well, look, to even, yeah, they're conflating this now. So even though this these charges are from, and I read the indictment again, 2021, we are, look at what he said 10 years ago, which somehow confirms what we're saying. We don't have to listen to these women. On August 22nd, BRICS nations, that's Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, are expected to announce the launch of a new international super currency fully backed by gold or other commodities. This is part of their long-term plan to supplant the U.S. and the dollar as cornerstones of the global financial system. You can protect your IRA or 401k from fallout from this landmark announcement by diversifying with gold from Birch Gold. Historically, gold has been a safe haven in times of high uncertainty, which is right now. When currencies fail, gold is a safe haven. How much more times the dollar have? We don't know. Protect your savings with gold. Birch Gold has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, plus thousands of happy customers. So text Candace to 989898 and get your free info kit on gold. If a central bank digital currency becomes a reality, it will be nice to have some gold to depend on. Again, text Candace to 989898. So I do want you to contextualize this video that has been circulating on the internet of you talking about the lover boy method. So we'll take a look at that right now. Sure. You cannot get a girl to work for you having fun. So the recruitment process is the same as the PhD course. You message them on Instagram. The PhD course is my recruitment system. I don't mention webcam until after I've had sex with the girl. If you're on dates and you're trying to mention it and shit, it just doesn't work. It puts them off. I'd never do that. That's disgusting. I'm not a whore. Uh, It's just not going to work. You continue as normal. No mention of webcam. You the girl. After you the girl, you do the PhD test. If she passes the PhD test and she wants to be with you, then you start mentioning things like, yeah, but you know, you're always busy. You're always at work. You can come work for me. Okay. So first question, when was this video taken? Yeah. So this video is from 10 years ago. And this is me explaining how having a webcam company is actually a larger video as a whole. I'm explaining how having a webcam company can affect your relationships and how it affects your dating life. It also explains the fact that one of the girls I was dating at the time was working on webcam at mm-hmm. the time. And it's explaining my general overall, explains my life and how things are affected owning a pornography company, because obviously a lot of women will be put off by that. It doesn't explain, it doesn't say, I'd be very careful how I answer this question because I'm currently under an investigation, right? Mm-hmm. So I'd be very careful how I answer it. People are trying to chop it up and say that it says I am using uh, the lover boy method to somehow convince women to do things they didn't want to do. This is obviously not the case. And none of this is in the case file for a reason because it doesn't exist. And none of these women are upset. But this is simply me explaining. It's actually a dating course I made a long time ago. And I'm a little bit embarrassed about it, to be honest with you, because it was 10 years ago and I was talking about women and dating and things in a way that I wouldn't talk about them anymore. Right. So yeah, and you look very young in the video. I'm super young. And I'm talking about, hey, when you sleep with this girl or you meet that girl or you meet this girl on Instagram and I have a webcam company, I don't tell them I have a webcam company. And I just think all oh, that's kind of crass and it's below me. Yeah. And I don't really like talking about it. And it's amazing how things change as you mature and you get older. But once again, I was a much younger man. I think if you were to take any 24-year-old and look at the stuff he puts on the internet, some of it's going to be stupid. And I think if you look at anybody who made things 10 years ago, some of it's going to be stupid. It's absolutely not really not criminal in any regard. There's right. nothing criminal about it. It has no bearing or any interest in the current case. But yeah, I was talking about how I talk. I don't mention I have a webcam business. The basic premise of the video was me explaining that I don't mention I have a webcam business ever and that I'm Mr. Rich and I have this nice car and I go on dates with girls. And sometimes when I say I have a webcam business, some of them want money and they want to work for me. That's the basic premise of it. Right. I'm glad to hear that you're not proud of the video. And I think that that's one of those things where I say that people 
don't allow you to grow up from things that you've done or said in the past. And this is obviously when you were operating a webcam business you're Completely. talking about. And, and that's the whole thing about the human experience. We're supposed to grow, right? And we're supposed to make mistakes and we're supposed to learn from them and we're supposed to uh, evolve as people. And I'm certainly not proud of the video. When I say I'm not sorry for what I've done, I don't mean it in a, I would do the same things again. I don't mean it that way. I mean that at the time, I was a lot less knowledgeable and I was younger and I made some mistakes. And just like I'm sure Jay-Z would never crack, sell crack again. Right. Exactly the same reason I would never make a stupid video saying something so stupid again. I also could have never predicted the fact that I was going to become one of the most famous people on the planet. Right. I didn't see that coming. And if I did, I would have been a lot more careful with what I said and how I said it. And I do think that it's part of every person's journey to make some mistakes and learn from them and grow from them. And I kind of find it interesting that if I was a reformed drug addict, there'd be no problem. If I was a reformed murderer, there'd be no problem. If I was a mafia boss and I'd sit here and I'd kill three people and we were doing an interview and I was like, yeah, I used to kill people. I've done my time. I'm out of jail now. I get less flack than if I made a video talking about dating when I used to have a business that did webcam than I currently get, you know? So all I can do is understand that I was a younger man. I did the best I could at the time. And uh, I was trying my very best to survive in a very harsh world. And I, I, I understand now that a lot of the way I said things, I certainly shouldn't have said them that way, but none of it is criminal. Right. And it, again, has no bearing on your case today, but I want to literally no bearing and it's conflation video is it's, being circulated yeah. without like people think that video was shot last week. Correct. And that's what's so good because it's good to mention that because people are trying to conflate them because in the current case against me, there's no case. Mm -hmm. Everybody understands there's no case. We're now in a situation where if the legal system is completely fair, then the case is over. So what they're trying to do is they're going to conflate with old videos of mine and they're going to try and muddy the waters and gaslight. And I will say that I am unhappy those videos exist and I will say I wish I never made them, but I won't say that I'm sorry because at the time I did the best I knew how to do. That's, and I think, I think that's important for the young kids that are following you, especially the young men to know like I say, I always hope that they, I talk about the mistakes that I made and I, I probably wouldn't even categorize them as mistakes. It's just things that I did. And I, if I could go back, of course, I wouldn't do it. Hindsight's twenty twenty. Yeah. but it's important for them to hear that. You know, I'm not proud of that. Obviously I'm not Completely. proud of it. And, and that's why I never push them to the world. And that's why I never, you know, propagate them in any way. Unfortunately, there's a weaponized attack against me where they still exist. Mm -hmm. And that's why I do so bad, so good to talk against them. I think that if you have a if you want to tell kids not to do drugs, you usually have a reformed drug addict to stand up and say, don't do drugs. I was a drug addict. It was a mistake. And I think that gives you a degree of credibility. So for me to sit here and say, be a lot more careful, one, with the way you say things on the internet, yeah. especially. Two, be a lot more careful with your interactions with women as a whole, especially in light of the Me Too movement and all these other things. Be very respectful. This video, this is a small clip. If you watch the video in, in its entirety, I actually talk about ex extensively about how you don't want to Get, make a woman feel pressured. You don't want to pick up a rape charge for no reason. If she feels upset or sad, make sure you get her a taxi home. I talk about all these things in the same video. So this is still the worst part of a very long form video taken out of context. However, I just think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from it. And yeah, if I have to be slightly embarrassed and a little bit taken aback by them so I can teach people the lessons and I'm going to teach people the lessons. And the basic premise is I was explaining how I have a webcam company and how it affects my romantic life. And that was how it was all encompassing and went together. And I think when I made the video, I got like 28 views. Yeah. And now it's being circulated. And now it's being circulated. And I'm being told I'm the worst person in the world by people who pretended they've never done anything wrong for the last 10 years. And also there has to be a degree of time. I like to think there's a statue of limitations. Like how long are you going to hold? They will for the rest of your career. I'm, I'm sure time. they will. And it's fine. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's just like, okay, 10 years ago, 10 years, a decade. Yeah, they're going to keep making you answer for it yeah. in every capacity. I've, I've seen that. In, God forbid you misspeak. You miss a word while you're saying something. Yeah. They will circulate it over and over again. That's just the yeah. world of social media. For me, what I feel is I don't feel guilty about them, but I do feel embarrassed because I don't feel like the way I spoke about women or the way I spoke about romantic relationships is my current view on romantic relationships. I think I've certainly matured. I was a young, brash, arrogant guy. This is what happens when you have a young kickboxer who's beating everyone up, making a bunch of money from the streets. I was a young, brash, arrogant guy, and I spoke in a way I perhaps shouldn't have spoke. And I'm sure if Jay-Z makes a song today, he won't speak about women and crack and drugs the way he used to speak about women and crack and drugs. It's just the reality of life. And you have to grow and you have to take the embarrassment which comes from growing. So I will certainly sit here and make sure, I think the whole world understands that that's not my message. That's not why I'm teaching young boys today. The young boys who are following me today have no interest in these videos and don't watch these videos unless they're pushed by haters. And I think that overall, I'm a net positive for the world. I think that men being so disenfranchised is 
I want to say something quickly about the British school system. The English school system has attacked me and they're trying to put me, they've spent billions of dollars trying to remove me from schools because young boys were running around saying, what color is your Bugatti and repeat, repeating my sayings. Yeah. I don't think I can really truly be held responsible for the fact that young boys repeat a saying, especially one that's not particularly aggressive. I think that shows that the young boys are looking for a hero and someone to look up to. And I feel like I'm filling a gap. And that's why I understand it's so important. I say very good things and teach very good things. And I don't think I would have learned so much good if I hadn't been involved to a degree with the dark and the bad. I don't think there is light without dark. A lot of my lessons and a lot of the messages I give to the world come from the fact that I grew up in one of the worst areas of the Western world, surrounded by drug dealers, surrounded by real pimps doing real bad things, surrounded by broken homes. I learned all these lessons. And if I had never had those experiences and never grew up in that scenario, how could I be a person who's now teaching young men, disenfranchised young men, the realities of the world? How could I? We talked earlier about having a sheltered life. A sheltered life doesn't allow you to be the kind of man who can teach. So yeah, I spoke in a way I shouldn't have spoke. Yeah, I regret the video completely. Have I ever hurt anybody? No. Has any of the girls who are being mentioned in that video come forward with anything other than defense of me? No. Nobody was actually hurt. It was just very brash, very arrogant, very bad delivery, which I regret. I can tell you something right now. If uh, love with you as a human being, if I had to watch clips of me 10, year, 10, 11 years ago, I would be so, I would be red. Even the black girl go red. I couldn't, I couldn't even look. Yeah. I wouldn't even want my husband to see it. So I feel your embarrassment. Well, this, and, 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 and this that's is why I, a part of me when I was, when they were regurgitating these clips, I was like, this is so unfair. It, it's so unfair to, it, yeah. to say I'm upset. And by and large, the stuff that you're saying to young men, even if there are certain things I don't agree with, Although I found it interesting that you said that peacocking is natural with men, because I think you're right now that you say it. I'm just a woman. and I don't understand it. Yeah. Um, but by and large, the stuff that you're saying today is not that. And so I just I think it's really you, you got to be really careful if you're convicting somebody on who they were a Com decade ago. Completely. And it's reformed drug addicts that will tell you not to do drugs. And it's reformed alcoholics uh, that will tell you not, not to, to drink, drink alcohol. Yeah. And, and I lived a life. I'm not going to sit here and try. And I think part of the reason, actually, and it is part of my image, you know, Top G is the name for any of the adults who are watching it. Top G is what they call me, my nickname. But part of it is the fact that I grew up in a bad area. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can fight. I have this money. I'm in this big compound in Romania with armed guards. And there's that, that degree of it. There's that nastiness and there's that rough to the edge, which makes my message so interesting for the young boys to watch. But that's because I came from a very rough life. And yeah, all I can do is apologize for the delivery, but I will not apologize for trying to do the best I could at the time we in the scenario I was in. For growing up. Completely. And I think that that's one of the things that sucks about being a public figure is every single moment that people are looking at it under a microscope. And I always say, I want to give people permission. I always say, I took the most liberal route to conservatism that there ever was. Yep. And so I just not so quick to judge people. And also I like to think, and I, this is one of the things I do say, if, if the most advanced forensic detectives on the planet with years of effort, if the worst they can drag up is me talking about women in a slightly derogatory way, I'm kind of happy with that. And I'll be honest, because I scroll Twitter and I see all these liberals who attack people all day end up getting ousted for child porn or this or that real things. And I'm like, thank God I have no skeletons for real, you know? So that's the worst version of me that anybody's ever going to see. And it was a long time ago and I learned my lessons from it. And uh, I do my very best to teach the lessons I learned, just like you said, to help people avoid going through the hardest way to possibly learn a lesson. And that's that's the reality of it. But that has no bearing on my current case. And I think that's what the confusion in my case is currently. People yeah. think that my case has something to do with that, even though they're completely unrelated events. Right. And that's why I'm trying to clarify and talking to you because I've realized that there's a lot of conflating going on. Um, and a lot of it is because America, I, I feel, is just now being sort of introduced to you. Whereas in the UK, you've been around for a while. And there was one, and I'm only familiar with your UK brand because of my husband. So I, I know that you've been big in the UK circuit for a very long time. And there was an old video, video that surfaced of you spanking a woman with a belt. Yep. Tell me you love me. Say it like you mean it. <laughs> you. Say it like you mean it. Mean it. You message one other guy ever again, whether we're together or not again. You understand me? This obviously has made it through the UK media for years. And I know, I know what that is based on my understanding of what happened with Big Brother when you yeah. were on Big Brother. But Americans are just seeing this video yeah. in a long montage of awful Andrew Tate videos. It's, so I want you to explain to them yeah. it, what that was. Sure. And again, this is another example of when the woman has already spoken out and clarified yeah. that this was not her being abused, but 
Absolutely. Yeah. The woman's already come forward instantly after the video. She came forward and made a video and said, look, this is between me and Andrew and it's, he never hurt me and I love him very much. And this is something that personal that happened in the bedroom. Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to say something about the video that's been released recently about me and my ex-boyfriend, Andrew Tate. Andrew is my still great friend. What you guys saw on the video is just what we used to do. It was just pure game. He's a great guy. He would never hurt anyone. Unless he's fighting. <laughs> and um, I just wanted to let you know that this is a huge misunderstanding because I heard he got kicked out from the house because of it, which I found very unfair it's because it was just pure game. It's just what we used to do. And it's actually interesting because when I got arrested, even recently, even though me and her are no longer together, she was also doing videos in my defense. She made a very recent video a few months ago saying, once again, very nice things about me. He is not a human trafficker. He would never rape anybody, and he would certainly never ever human traffic anyone either, including his brother. They would never do such thing. I am just so shocked, and I'm so fed up with all of these lies. And you're right about public life. Having your dirty laundry or your life thrown out there to the world is kind of interesting. And it's interesting how fast people throw stones, because I know how clean my life is compared to most people's lives. And I know that just from conversations I've had at dinner tables. I know from just dinner table conversations. You talked earlier about dinner table conversation people have in couples, etc. I've been sitting around in very private rooms with very rich people, and I've been in very important places and also some very low places. And I've heard people talk and I'm like, if your life was on display, like my life was on display, it would be a real circus. Mm. I mean, imagine you could be the son of a president. Imagine if their life was on display and you could find out some really interesting things. So me personally, yeah, these things are the same old regurgitated things from 10 years ago that have been previously explained. That was also, I was going to say, can you date that video when that video? 20, that... 20 it, it must have been, how old was I? 2015, maybe 2014, okay. a long time ago. Right. And I think the best defense for all of these things, personally, I don't think that anybody should take my word for it. I think the best defense for all of these things are the voices of the woman directly involved. Right. We say, believe all women, right? That's what we say, isn't it? Okay, well, you don't have to listen to a word I say or believe a word I say. If you think I've done something wrong to a woman and the woman stands up and goes, no, I love him, that's garbage, the next should be the end of the issue, I believe. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm getting libertarian again. But um, No, I mean, I, I very much agree with it. And this kind of gets into, um, oh, gosh, what is the name of the guy in Hollywood that he just went under me to? And, uh, Hammer something? Yeah, Army Hammer, Yeah. right? And this is another person I defended on my show. He was in consensual relationships. They, BDSM was his thing. He was very clear that it was his thing. The girls were okay with it. Maybe, maybe because he was a Hollywood star, but he never lied. He never coerced. He never confused. And then suddenly one of these women decides to speak out against him. Now they've just cleared him of all charges. And I, I sort of have the perspective that if they were doing this in a consensual relationship, respective, irrespective of how I might examine it and say, I would never do this yeah. in a consensual relationship. Yeah. You can't then turn him into a rapist. Well, this is the thing. I don't think many people understand, especially the men who are vilifying me and attacking me and anyone who's upset by me, understand that first they come for me and then they're going to come for you. They come for any man that they don't like. And the way they do it is this is the weapon. They sit and go, okay, let's take some kind of sexual crime because it's heinous and it damages their name. And then because it's subjective, right? You say rape, you're right. Rape traditionally was grab a woman off the street and hurt her. Well, he didn't do that, but he did have a consensual relationship for years. And then now his girlfriend can be convinced to turn on him for a paycheck mm -hmm. because the, the media will hype her up, make her famous and pay her a wage. Now he's a rapist or even by cra more crazy extension. Let's look at the lover boy method. We have a man here who has spoken to a woman in a very nice, polite, kind way has never even had a BDSM relationship with her, hasn't hurt her, hasn't hit her, only spoke to her nicely. She is saying he is nice. She is saying he did nothing. Okay, she's brainwashed and he used lover boy. You can't even be nice anymore. You can't even be, if the government want to put you in jail for sexual crime, you can be a man with a woman, speak to her with absolute respect. She can love you with all her heart and say he has never hurt me and you are still a criminal. Right. Right. Think, think of the, think of the mind bending. It's crazy. As a man, you're not safe. You're not safe. If they want to get you, they're going to get you and they're going to use this avenue because this is the most heinous possible crime you can be accused of. The process itself is the punishment. Let's look at what's happened to me. All those months of investigation. During all those months of investigation, there are pages and pages of files 
everything I did everywhere I went, they were looking for me to break a law. I don't break laws. If I had even sped in a car, if I had littered, if I had done anything, it would all be in the case file. So they're, they're spying on my entire life trying to find a crime. They can't find one. Then they go through my entire personal life, which is now all over the internet, leak it all over the internet. So you go through the embarrassment. Mm. Then they seize all your money. $15 million have taken of my money. Then I went to jail for three months. Now I'm on house arrest. By the time I'm found innocent, I've been punished. The whole, the process is the punishment. The process is the embarrassment. The process is teaching you a lesson. So it's not even about innocent and guilty. I don't think most people at home understand that if they want to hurt you, if you get to a level of influence where powerful people go, you, we have to damage this guy's name. We're going to accuse him of a sexual crime. It doesn't matter if you can prove yourself innocent three years from the point they accuse you because right. you've already been wrecked. That's the entire goal of it, right? So now we're living here. I'm sitting here as a person who's accused of a crime. The victims are on my side. There's no one against me but the state. I've done nothing wrong. There's these Twitter detectives, Twitter internet detectives who know who funds them, trying their very best to prove me guilty for no reason by taking old videos and conflating the issue and trying to make it complicate when it doesn't need to be. And it, I just sit here and think- They are complicating the issue. I, I very much agree with you on that. I think that the, the goal of digging up these old videos was to say, well, that this somehow legitimizes the case against him in Romania. Yeah. And that's just not true, right? You can say- it, you, you even said it. You're not proud of these videos. You can say, I think Andrew Tate is immoral. I think the things that he said here are not principal. They're trying to say that because of things that you said 10 years ago, you shouldn't have a I'll platform for these young men today. It's just too much conflation. I made a pro, I made pro atheist videos back then. And I'm very embarrassed of those. Right. I'm extremely embarrassed of the videos. I would sit and say, God is not real. In fact, I'm more embarrassed of those videos than any other video. Wow. And I would sit there and now I'm, I'm devout to my religion. So I would sit there and try and talk about how God wasn't real. And I thought I was smart. And now I watch it and think I was an idiot. Mm -hmm. And I like to think of myself as a pretty wise person. I wouldn't have a platform if I wasn't wise. And I'm 36 years old, but at 25, I was a dummy. And I think that any 36-year-old, if you were to ask him, were you a dummy especially at 25? Boy. I feel like young men especially take you're a little of, longer to Completely. You're mature. full of testosterone. I was making money out of Lambo. I was fighting. I was beating everyone to pieces. I had a few hot girlfriends. I thought I was Mr. Hotshot. Yeah. Like, is that the worst thing in the world? Like, who who is it? Right? So, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting that they're going to attack me with these forever, and that's fine. I do believe, however, that Allah is the best of planners. And I am in many ways, I wouldn't say happy, but I feel like this whole criminal investigation is going to be a fantastic end to all of this once I'm found innocent, right. I believe. And I do believe I'll be found innocent. I've seen all of the case against me and there is no case. And it's very difficult to put somebody in jail when there's nobody saying he did anything wrong. For people at home who are confused about my criminal case, just so they understand, I'll explain it one more time. Two girls in April who visited Romania for five days, wanted money for shopping, didn't get it, accused us of kidnapping them. These are girls who have accused seven other men of kidnapping slash human trafficking. Romanian authorities turn up and within an hour said they weren't kidnapped. This is stupid and threw it away. Then they picked up this case for some reason, by some recommendation later on down the line, come up with this whole lover boy garbage. The two girls, there's four girls in the case. Two of the girls who were accused of who I've supposedly lover boy are on my side. We have the two initial girls who said that they were kidnapped who are on CCTV walking in and out of the house as much as they want. And she's accused seven other men of kidnapping. That's the case against me. So... I have enough faith in justice that it's all going to be put away pretty quickly. But um, yeah, I wish those old videos didn't exist, but much more than those, I'm far more embarrassed about old videos I made that were anti-God. I feel genuinely bad about those, much worse than that. So it's just, but that's I'm, not what you're selling to kids today. I, absolutely not. I'm doing the absolute opposite. Right. I'm trying to push children towards religion. Right. I'm trying to push kids towards God. And it's amazing that I, it's amazing that I'm being attacked with these videos and I'm embarrassed by them. That's fine. But I'm glad my atheistic videos didn't appear. I'd be far more embarrassed. I'd feel genuinely shameful to watch those. Mm. But, you know, we're human and we make mistakes and all, all we can do is grow, like you said. Yeah. Um, trust me, I went through the conservative ringer too. Uh, the suddenly... What did they hit you with? All sorts of things. I mean, they hit me with an uh, old anti-bullying company that I was trying to put together based on something that I lived through when I was in high school. And they tried to say, essentially, that I was trying to dox people. I still have to answer for a splash page for an anti-bullying company that I tried to create with the most goodness in my heart. And they still throw it at me. She's a fraud. This is not what she actually thinks. I mean, I have to answer the conspiracy. Some things are even cr they're crazy. Yeah. That George is some George's father is somehow related to the Rothschild. And I, I mean, it, it gets crazy. And, and the bigger that you, the bigger your platform becomes, the more they dig into your history and they'll dig into ex-boyfriends. I mean, it, it never goes away. But I 
I'm hardened to the process. I am who I am. I'm proud. I actually am proud of a lot of the things that I lived through, a lot of the mistakes that I've made because it made me who I am today. It's interesting you say hardened to the process because I think I am too. Because when I watch old content of mine or things I wish I didn't do or say, I will feel guilty or I'll feel shameful or I'll feel embarrassment because of me. I don't care what people think. Mm -hmm. I don't care. If, if some conservative wants to watch a video and make a video, I don't, I don't care. It's about me and my own personal morals and my own personal morality and how it's evolved and how I feel about things I've done. It's all about me. It's internalized. I don't care what these people say externally because I know that nobody is perfect. And I also stick by this. And I've said it many times, but I know it absolutely not lead to be true. Anybody who is attacking me, if they'd been under the level of forensic assault I've been under, would have far worse things out there in the public, right. I'm sure. Right. And I know that one of the charges against you is that you're materialistic. You're describing that as peacocking. And it's funny, when I see you with Lamborghinis or whatever, I don't know anything about cars, whatever the cars are. I always think of, I'm friends with a lot of UFC fighters. Yep. And um, one of the ones that I have great respect for is Colby Covington. Yeah, yeah. And it's so funny because when I have my podcast, he's sort of this quiet guy, super respectful, just yeah. not at all what you're getting in the ring. Yeah. And when we talked about that, he said, you know, no one pay attention to my fights. And then suddenly I'm in Brazil. I think I'm about to get dropped. Then I start talking a bunch of trash. And suddenly Completely. he's got a huge audience behind him. And this is part of the the, the men like the bragging. The men like the peacocking. Completely. Um, and so I love it. And that's why I say when I see some of these videos and I see conservatives assigning like real meaning to you saying stuff that is just so obviously content for young boys. It's yeah. the only way I can describe it. I mean, this is just like a bunch of guys just being guys and yep. the girls just be like this is so stupid yep. that's my reaction it's so stupid but i'm why are we trying to assign real meaning to this this well, is like guys, this is how guys have fun the same way that girls sit around and talk about real housewives yeah absolutely it's bravado it's just it's girls are into my husband cannot do like five seconds of hearing me and my girlfriends talk about things he's like yep. i'm out yep and this is what woman him and his guys are together and he's like they're fishing and the first catch you gotta bite the head off. i'm like that is so stupid yeah so ridiculous yeah. why do you are you biting a head off of a fish yeah. but it's just boys being boys and girls being girls completely and so i think that people should not assign like i mean i've seen really stupid videos of you and they're trying to really assess these videos as if this is like i'm like this is just what they're i call it, yeah. posting well yeah they're taking and it now you see colby he's got these hot girls in bikinis he's behind cars on his thing and i think it's hilarious and i think it's funny because it's i get it it's for it's not for me and that's not the, for me. And that's the thing, actually, which a lot of conservatives in the conservative movement don't understand is that by attacking somebody for having a little bit of fun or for, for being bravado, for having some bravado or saying something audacious or having a nice car, whatever. Bugatti, whatever. Yeah. yeah if you're going to attack people for that, you're just going to drive young boys away from your message. And yeah. you need the youth of a message for the message to exist and survive. If you're going to just be Mr. Boring and be upset by everything, then nobody's gonna wanna have any affiliation with it. I really do believe the reason liberals owned the culture for so long is because liberalism overall, it looks, it's not, because when you become spiritual, you understand that it destroys your soul, but it looks fun. It does look fun. It looks fun, because there's no rules. Yeah. And you can do a bunch of dumb stuff, you can take drugs, you can run around, go to orgies, and watch porn, and sleep with all these degenerate women, and they're all promiscuous, and it's a big party, it looks fun. And we talk about culture and how important it is to live when the culture, okay, well, then I come along and I'm largely conservative minded and I have this massive fan base and then you're going to attack me and say, Andrew has a car and that's bad. Yes, well, they're like, cares, they're, cares, is, yeah. is that the fight you want? Yeah. Is that how you're going to win this culture I war? I very much separate myself from the conservatives that do that. I'm like, this is, I, on my show, I'll show a clip and I'm like, I can't believe this is even being passed around as something that should be taken seriously. It's so stupid. Yeah. It's so ridiculous. It's so obviously content for guys. Yeah. This is what I imagine if my husband left to his own devices and he's around all of his lab in the UK. I mean, the stuff they talk about is just so stupid. I, but, but then he thinks the same thing about me when I'm with all of my Completely. girls. It's so stupid. Completely. And we do need to stop being so severe. Okay, it's materialism. Okay, we get all, I get what you're trying to say, but also this is just fun content for guys. But then let's also talk about the materialism thing, right? Because it's interesting to me that conservatives will sit and say, oh, materialism is bad or it's anti-Christian, et cetera. And I understand where there might be a point to argue there. But I tell you something, if you're completely and utterly broke, then you need the government to eat then you're in a lot of trouble. Mm. We talk about the matrix and resisting the matrix. One of the tools to doing that is financial freedom. And this is one of the baseline realities of it. I'm not saying you should sell your soul for money. Absolutely not. Really not. But if you want to truly resist the matrix as a whole, you need to have money to do it. It's pretty hard to do when you're broke. Even me as a person, if I had no money, the current situation I'm in would absolutely not really destroy me. I, I would be completely and utterly wrecked. Like, how could I pay my bills? I've taken $15 million of my money. I'm locked in my house. So you need to have a degree of financial freedom. Otherwise, you're going to end up just doing what you have to do to eat. 
You look at these people in England, there was a video that recently was on Twitter. I felt really sad when I saw it. It was a workman taking down the British flag and putting up the pride flag. And someone shouted at him, hey, bro, you're moving, you're removing the wrong flag. And he goes, I know, mate, I know. You're taking the wrong flag down, mate. I don't know that. At least you know that. But he had to pay the bills. He has to feed his family. What can he do? He's a flag hole. He's a flag hanger. All he can do is hang the flags. If he doesn't do it, someone else will do it. He loses his job. So if you're completely and utterly reliant on a wage or you have no money, well, now you have a new tool of enslavement. COVID was all based around that. Ah, oh, I just got to go to work. Ah, oh, I just get the injection. Ah, oh, I got to wear the mask. I got to fly. I got to work. Got to work. Got to work. It, it takes a lot of money to sit down and say, no, I'm too principled. That takes money to do. So it's also interesting that conservatives want to attack materialism. Okay, perhaps I didn't have to buy a fancy car. You can get upset about that if you like. But if you're not financially free, it's also pretty difficult to stand up and tell the truth. Even if you make a lot of money, if you're reliant on, let's say, a sports team for a contract, even if you make a lot of money, if you don't have enough saved, you can't tell the truth. Even if you're rich, they're all still complying and bending because they have a contract they're adhering to. It's difficult. So I don't think that if you had somebody who was trying to inspire the masculine youth of tomorrow to resist the slave mind, teaching them to be financially free would be a bad thing. Like I think it would actually be a good thing. I think men need it because they think view it as aspirational and no one escapes it. I would definitely not describe my husband as materialistic at all. He likes cars. There's just something about cars that men like. Absolutely. I, I get, my son, truck, 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 car. It's like, it's psychotic. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a boy. Every time he sees a truck, a car, any car that looks cool, he's two. Yeah. He's two. So there is something ingrained in men that Completely. He, his first word was truck. You know, every time a garbage truck goes by anything, he's just like a school bus. Men like that for whatever reason. Boys like that. Men like that. It's asp I don't think we need to overthink it. Yeah, absolutely. It's aspirational. But also, if we're going to actually look at the meta point, I believe that teaching financial freedom, I think teaching financial freedom is one of the very important ways you teach people to resist a slave mind. I don't think you can resist a slave mind if you're completely and utterly broke on welfare or living paycheck to paycheck for a large corp, which is insistent on trying to install the slave programming inside of your head. Mm. I think it's very, very difficult. I actually think financial freedom is a key component to it. And I think that me standing up and showing a life that costs $50 million a year or something ridiculous, doing that on purpose and trying to inspire men to make as much money as possible is actually a very key component to the resistance to the slave mind. I don't think many people understand this because if you teach young men how to go out there and become rich as possible, it's very difficult they can do that without learning some degree of mental fortitude, mm -hmm. without learning how to speak to people, without learning how to network, without learning how to be competent and disciplined and motivated and work hard. And then they do all that, they have enough money so that when someone comes along and says, take this injection, they'll say, no, I don't want to take the injection. I'd rather miss the flight. So there is a key component of resistance without, which actually involves materialism. Mm -hmm. I'll argue that if I was exactly the same person with the same viewpoints, but I was completely and utterly flat broke, I wouldn't be able to make the same impact on the world. And I wouldn't be able to resist the programming the same because I need to eat food. So I'd actually counter argue any conservative who's complaining about my beautiful car collection of 42, not one, 42 nice cars, that having a lot of money is actually an important way to resist the matrix. I can only talk from personal experience, but the number of times, especially during COVID, for example, where I managed to not have to comply with any of the laws simply because I was loaded, it was, I can't even name one, I, on tw 10 hands. So materialism is important. I think we should be teaching, especially the young boys, especially people who understand who want to live in a very rational world, who want to live in a world which is based on common sense and dignity and honor and respect and all the things we're trying to teach through conservatism is that if they don't have a degree of fin financial stability or financial independence, they're going to end up getting wrecked anyway. They're going to work for wo Woke Corp. And Woke Corp's going to change its Twitter picture or X picture, whatever it's called now, to a pride flag, and they're going to be screwed anyway. So you have to be teaching to a degree financial independence. I don't know why that's seen as a bad thing. I'd actually really like to argue that point with, who was complaining about my car? I think... <laughs> who was complaining about my was one of, of my 42 cars? I think it was a packaged you know, this video and kind of showing that you're not actually good for young men. And they wonder why, and they wonder why they lose the culture war. Imagine sitting there telling young men, don't have a nice car like him. Don't be fun like him. Don't do that. Like, what plan are you people on? No one have a sense of humor. Like, I think Colby Covington's Instagram is hilarious. Completely. I know this is not how he lives. Like, first off, to be an MMA fighter, his whole life is diet, extra. I mean, Correct. he's beating his body every day. He Correct. doesn't really have time to be going to the strip club. And, yeah. you know, but I, I get the brand. I think it's hysterical. He's actually a really wonderful human being. And I'm I'm happy that I'm not so serious that I don't see the humor in this. And, that, and boys love it. They do. They do love it. It's. And I wonder if these people really don't see the humor or if they're just so desperate to find an attack vector 
that yeah. they're just going to get know. upset by question. jokes. I think that's a good question. I think, but I will actually, I want to get to what your belief in is in terms of when you start talking about the matrix, because I will say I, some of the people that have been going after you, Liz Wheeler obviously has been one of them. Who? Um, Liz Wheeler has been one of them. I think you Who? blocked her. <laughs> um, Ali Stucky has talked a lot about it. I know these young women, they're not a part of the matrix. Okay. I have a lot of disagreements with them. Stylistically, we have disagreements. Ali's a, uh, is a, means what she says. Even if I disagree with her point, I know she means what she said. It's not an act for her. She's not trying to do anything. She says it because she believes it. I've known her for years. She's actually been very good to me when people were very, the the, the guard of conservatism. Allie had me on her show. She had a platform for me. Liz genuinely believes everything that she's saying. I don't think she's a part of the matrix, even if I think that there are some pieces of it of your life and why people gravitate towards you that she doesn't fully understand. And maybe she never will understand it. But they, to me, are not a part of the matrix. Okay, so... So let's talk about what the matrix is sure. and what the matrix isn't. Sure, let's talk about the matrix. Before we that, before we do that, let's talk about this recent conservative attack. I want to make it clear that I don't watch basically any of the attack videos made on me. I'm, I'm busy and I'm very happy with my life and I don't allow attacks on my psyche. If somebody makes a video that attacks me, I don't watch it. I don't watch it because I don't want to watch it because I don't care. I don't watch them either. I don't care. Yeah. And I don't say this to insult Liz or anyone else. I don't know them enough or respect them enough to give a shit what they made or what they say. I don't care. So I can't talk about the specifics of what she said because I don't know what she said because I didn't watch it. However, I don't believe it was well-intentioned. I think that there is certainly a degree of jealousy that came with my massive influence and the number of views I got on the Tucker Carlson show. I think that the fact that 10 year old videos, which have been debunked 30 times are now coming up again is not well-intentioned at all, but I can't be entirely not really sure of that. So I can't comment specifically on their attacks because I haven't watched their attacks. I don't. I think they're seeing those videos for the first time. That's why I said, I'm trying to bridge the gap between, I only knew about those videos for a long time because I've been paying attention to, the, to yeah. your UK career. Yeah. I don't believe these people have been. I think the first time they were introduced to you was on Tucker Carlson's interview. Yeah. If I'm guessing, I have not spoken to them, but I'm, so they're just seeing this. Then somebody starts circulating old clips and they are like, oh my God, this person, this must be true. Again, guessing, have not spoken to them about you at all. Got it. Well, it's up to them to come to their own conclusions about me. I'll live my life and I'll continue to live my fantastic life and I'll be the best person I can be. And they can come to their own conclusions. And they can make videos in support of me or attack me for the rest of human time. I'm not going to watch any of it. I'm not interested. Right. So that's those two. But um, in regards to the Matrix as a whole, the Matrix, I believe, and I use the term the Matrix from the movie because I think it perfectly describes the world we're in today. I believe we're living in a false reality which is projected inside of our minds and it's designed to distract us long enough for our bodies to be abused. And the movie is from body heat. In the real world, perhaps it's for some physical labor. But I believe that we're not living in a real version of reality. I believe there are gatekeepers on the truth, the agents, who try their very best to keep us asleep. And I think the end goal is to keep us distracted long enough for our body to be utilized and then for us to die. Who is the matrix and what is the matrix as a whole? I have to be very careful what I say and I don't want to get in too much trouble. But I think anybody who is perspicacious enough to understand how the world works understands that the media machine is trying very hard to keep us convinced to keep us convinced of certain ideas and also to keep us arguing about very unimportant ideas so people behind the media machine who decide what goes on the news can do whatever they want to do mm -hmm. and those the things they do usually have dire consequences to all of our lives right. so i would say that the matrix as a whole is the media machine from the projection point of view and that the people who control the media try very hard to make sure they have ultimate control over all governments and all important decisions on the planet i agree I, to I totally agree. I, Welcome I, to the conspiracy. I thought, well, no, I Welcome to the it, conspiracy. No, I mean, don't listen to my podcast. I'm in on like CIA documents, like showing people this is not, it's not a conspiracy. <laughs> These are declassified CIA documents. These are things that they actually did and that nobody pays attention to because it happened 60 years ago, but it's been declassified, you know, uh, all the operations that they had, putting actual journalists under CIA pay. I mean, it's crazy following the death of JFK. Why did they do that? Why did they suddenly feel it was necessary to have journalists on payroll following the death of a president? Yeah. Uh, who there were a lot of questions surrounding his death. So you're you've got the right audience with me. When in terms of that, I think I think the media is the enemy of the American people. Yeah. That is why I, I I liked Trump calling that out right away, talking about fake news. What I don't understand is why anybody listens to anything they say. I know it is because they've been caught lying so many times. Mm -hmm. 
Is it just because they lie on repeat over and over again to the point where people just accept it? Is it because it's cowardice and accepting that these people constantly lie to you makes you adopt a worldview, which is scary because you have to now think for yourself? I'm not sure what it is, but how after, especially the last five to six years, especially the last five to six years, can you believe a word these people say to you? Well, because if they say it enough, it becomes true. And that's been, they, they've been able to show that, that if you say something over and over again to someone, they will accept it as a truth. And that was another uh, declassified CIA experiment. Was super interesting. They put a bunch of people in the room. So let's say there's 20 people in a room, right? And 19 of them are agents. And one of them is actually the person they're testing. And they show you a picture of what is clearly a banana. Yeah. And they go around the room. The last person they get to is the one that's the, the experiment's not. Everyone else is an yeah. agent. And they say, what is this? And the first person says, apple. Apple. It's clearly a banana. Yeah. By the time they get to that 19th person who is not an agent, that person just says it's an a it's an apple, even though it's clearly a banana. They, they don't even believe their own eyes anymore because they're going, okay, well, if 18 people in this room have said that it's an apple, what do you see? An apple, apple, apple. Then they just say apple. So they, there's a lot of evidence. They do it because it works. And, and everything around us shows you it works. We're right now debating whether or not you know, children can pick their gender. How did we get here? This is this is something that you couldn't even fathom when we were in high school. That people would be saying like, "Your little boy could be a little girl," but we're here today, and actual adults are believing this information because it's been said enough times to whatever segment of the population that they're accepting it as true. So they do it because it's been effective. And that's why God is so important because God is a hard line that you cannot be crossed. Which right? That's why you will not be libertarian. That's why I'll not be libertarian. You will not be libertarian. That's right. No, but if you have, if you, if, yeah, it's true because if you have faith then there's rights and wrongs. Like you said earlier, there's sin and there's good and there's a line that can't be crossed and the PSYOP is very difficult to penetrate. And that's mm -hmm. why in the Islamic world, for example, we have very little of these problems because it's haram. Problem solved. <laughs> haram. <laughs> Next. But um, yeah, it's, 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 it's certainly scary. And I don't think people understand how evil absolute power will make a person. I don't think people understand how petty and how vindictive and how degenerate absolute power will make people. I think there's a degree of naivety in the population when you talk about the matrix and the people who are behind the media and they believe these people might be powerful people or rich people, but not necessarily bad people. But unfortunately, I don't think they really truly understand the reality. I had a theory that I was arguing with somebody with, and I keep using COVID because it's a perfect example of the PSYOP. Everybody who once believed in COVID now no longer believes, mostly all of them, which I find actually remarkable. Because when I talk about COVID now in front of 20 people, everyone's like, yeah, man, that was garbage. But during COVID, oh, yeah. I couldn't find a single person who wouldn't wear the mask. I was like, oh, I'm by myself. I got arrested in Germany. Me and Tristan got arrested, surrounded by mask wearers, in handcuffs. I'm like, what the? And I guarantee if I was standing in front of those people now, they'd all be like, yeah, COVID was stupid. So it's, it's amazing how people want to flip and forget reality. So I use COVID because people were fully psyoped and now they're not psyoped. And I'm trying to wake you people up to understand something about how garbage it all is. I'm trying my very best to make people understand that the people who make the news have no interest in you being informed. Mm -hmm. Why would they make the news and broadcast it to you everywhere for you, little Mr. Nobody, to understand how the world works? Why would they care about you knowing anything that's important ever? We're not a slave if, you, if you're knowledgeable. And that's why I always say, go back to when we had physical slavery in America, a requirement to maintain that was ensuring that slaves didn't learn how to read. That was part of the slave code. They weren't allowed to learn how to read. And if you were caught teaching a slave how to read, you you too, as a, a master, would would be, fall victim, right? And that it was so important for them because they know that an educated mind can't be enslaved. Absolutely. So the goal of the mainstream media is to keep people stupid. And it is why I think that despite the fact that you admittedly say that you are not a conservative and despite the fact that you're, I don't think you're overtly political, none of that really matters. I think what matters now is what you will do with the platform that you have, Completely. what impact you will have. Completely. And inspiring people to free think and to not believe all the slave programming which is told to them and to not just follow lockstep with the lies that are given to them, I think in and of itself makes you a conservative and to a degree makes you political. Unfortunately, now that's how the divide exists. If you're teaching people to think for themselves and be strong people of agency and self-respect, then you're going to be on one side of the political spectrum. And if you're teaching people to be the absolute opposite, you're going to be on the other side. And by extension, I guess I am political and I am conservative just because I'm telling men to stand up and to be strong and to think for themselves. And that makes you resist the slave programming. And I like to believe that the conservatives themselves have resisted slave programming the most. Um, but yeah, it's... It's a scary world we're now living in where things that I'm saying, which were basically completely accepted by the entire population 15 years ago, are enough to make me the most hated man in the world. Mm -hmm. Isn't that crazy? I think yeah. the things I'm saying are things that were widely accepted for a very long period of human time. I think they're the things that are still widely accepted in most of the world today. I think it's the decadence of the West that allow us to pretend these ideas and these realities don't exist. Mm -hmm. 
And I don't know how long we're going to last under this false reality. I don't know how long society can possibly function with the insanity that they're trying to purport on the population of the West. The fact that so many calories in the Western world, genuine calories from food and human time is wasted discussing pronouns and trying to get somebody's pronouns correct in a sentence that they've made up, which change at random. Think of the absolute insanity of that. And how long can a society actually function with that degree of decadence and absolute asinine behavior? I don't know how long it can even function anymore. I think the West is in a lot of trouble. And it's almost like, especially certain talking points, and I find myself guilty of it as well. We talk about certain talking points which are pushed to the front. And I kind of feel like they are a mass distraction. They have to be because they're so ridiculous. But the problem is, people, there's a certain percentage of the population that genuinely believe them. I would love to live in a world where they try and push the idea that a man is a woman or that a man can change to a woman and then compete in women's sports without an advantage. I would love for them to try and push that idea and for everybody to go, this is stupid. Next. No. But because some people believe, we have to now waste our time discussing and debunking the most obvious, hello, water is wet, we have to sit here and talk about the sky being blue for days and weeks and years almost at a time. Talk about the ultimate distraction tool by the matrix for them to sit there and go, you know what? Let's come up with some absolute garbage and let's throw it to the front and the smart people will fight against it, but enough dummies will disagree with it and that'll keep them distracted while we do something that matters. And we find my, I even find myself falling victim to it because it's so necessary because a certain subsect of the population is so dumb that they believe it. If people were all just a little bit less receptive to the slave programming, everyone would stand up and say, no, you're going to try harder than that next. And we could discuss something that actually matters. And this is the point I was going to say earlier about COVID. So COVID, I think a lot of people do not understand how petty and vindictive power can genuinely make somebody. And I had an argument with a friend of my brother about two or three years ago during COVID when you had to wear a mask when you went in the restaurant and then you sat down, you took it off and then you ate and you put it back on to go to the toilet and you took it off. And I said, I hope you understand there is someone somewhere, some billionaire on a yacht who is doing this as a compliance exercise, as a joke. I know. As a joke. And he goes, why would you do all that just for a joke? Because if you're in charge of the entire world and you have unlimited money, what's going to make you happy? A Ferrari? You've had Ferraris your whole life. Boring. All that you care about is power, compliance. It's all funny to you. It's vindictive. It's petty. Why not? You're in charge. For the same reason, if you're in charge of a big company, you're like, you know, I want you all in at 8.45 tomorrow. Why not? It's a power play. Ego, status, respect, all the things we are talking about earlier. These people are born into massive influence. Money doesn't make them uh, feel powerful. They've never worked for anything in their lives. Now they have a little bit of control over you. They're going to make you do some dumb so they can laugh at you. I'm telling you, it was thing. a joke. I say, I say the same thing. I'm like, there's no way they're not just playing like Simon says to see if we can, they can actually make 100%. people abide by these things and people keep actually abiding by them. There's no way that they're not sitting back laughing. It's a joke. It, they, they must be laughing because it's, it's, it's so preposterous. And people don't understand that there are people in the world who have power, who are literally vindictive enough to just mess with the entire populace for a joke. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people understand when you look at the matrix as a whole and yeah, you talk about the media machine and how it's trying to push these ideas on you and the people behind it, the people behind it do not have any kind of genuine intention. Mm -hmm. Their intentions are absolutely and utterly selfish. They want to feel good and feel powerful no matter what it takes. kind of evil and scary that these people have a worldview which is so logically flawed, is so devoid of genuine rationale that they have to go to the most susceptible subsect of the population to inject it. Which is that why you should get married, because the guard against that is strong families. Is it? It is a nuclear family. It is a mom and a dad sitting around the dinner table saying, what did you learn at school? It'd say it's mom guarding at home, going through their homework and seeing what they're learning and saying, absolutely not. And it's dad going to work, building. And that nuclear family is the only guard against handing over your children to the government, which is why in the next five years, I just think you should get married. The only guard except Islam. What? No. I don't have to worry about my children's homework. Thank you very much. It's all handled by God. And it's interesting you said that, though. It is a good point. And I think Matt Walsh actually said something about me having, uh, I have children from a few different women. I don't like to give details on it. But uh, so does Elon Musk. And I do think, although this may be elitist, I will state here that at a certain level of finance, it's not the same crime as it would be if I was a traditionally financed individual.
I can afford two or three families and I can afford to see them all and I can afford to go to three countries in a single day on my jet if I need to. And I'm a very good father to all my children. I love them very much. And you're right. I completely agree with you. The nuclear family is the answer. My solution is not the solution for everyone, but the nuclear fancy family is the answer. I agree with you. But uh, Islam is also an answer. Well, I don't know enough about the Islamic faith to be able to counter you on that point, but I do think that it, having all your children around the dinner table, brother, sister, rival, this is beautiful the rib, well. it's, it's beautiful. Of course. I want that for you. Of course. It's, so. beautiful. it's beautiful as well. The Candace Owens Podcast is supported by Grand Canyon University, an affordable private Christian university with a vibrant campus in beautiful Phoenix, Arizona, that's ranked top 20 in the country according to Niche.com. GCU is a missional, Christ-centered university that strives to foster a culture of community, giving, and impact. GCU's goals is to help you develop into a servant leader who makes a difference through finding your purpose and fulfilling God's plan. With 330 academic programs and over 270 online as of June 2023, GCU integrates the free market system with a welcoming Christian worldview into your bachelor's, master's, or doctoral degree. And... You'll have support from your own university counselor who takes a personalized approach in helping you achieve your goals. So find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Private, Christian, affordable. Visit gcu.edu. Okay. But, sorry, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I have to, we talk about Darwinism. I'll ask you another question because I'm very interested. Do you think abortion is Dar Darwinism? It's an argument that can be made, right? Killing off your own offspring, it means that you're, you're not putting your offspring into But like, these people with the sign, yeah. I killed 10 of my kids. Yeah. It's, isn't that, I mean, it's evil. It's yeah. satanic. It shouldn't happen. I'm not saying that it's a good thing. I'm just asking, is there a Darwinistic element to all of this? That when I look at that the earth will be populated with conservatives because their ideas, I mean, my husband always says the left is a death cult. If you look at all of their ideas, they lead to death, right? They, you can't procreate. You're killing off your own offspring. Every single one of their ideas leads to death and destruction. It's unbelievable. Yeah. So in the end, you'd have to have the perspective that conservatives went naturally because we're talking about- If we own the culture. Yeah. But we don't. So what they're doing is they're, they're using the culture to sigh off enough young children who are not living- a traditionalistic life, or like you're saying, or not having a strong family, nu uh, nuclear family to keep them against the slave programming. And they're using them to create the new generation of death cultists to continue to keep humanity under attack. But I don't know. I, I really struggle. As a person, I try my very best to, my father had a saying, which I use, I allow manipulation to find out where my enemy wants me to go, and then I use my mind to break the trap and punish the perpetrator. And the reason he said that was because if you don't allow them to manipulate you, you don't know exactly where they want you to go. Mm -hmm. If they try to manipulate you and you absolutely notly resist, you might end up taking another path towards the same destination. So you should allow them to manipulate you. Watch the slave programming, watch the propaganda, watch all of it. Find out what you want, them, what they want you to believe, and then you can use your mind to instantly break the trap. I did it in COVID. And when I first watched COVID, when I watched the Italian hospitals and people falling over in China, at the very, very beginning of it, I sat there and thought, what do they want me to believe? They want me to be scared of this disease. They want me to be afraid. No, I'm not going to be afraid. So if I'm not afraid, what's the answer? Well, the answer is to go to which country? Sweden's open. Nobody talks about the fact that Sweden was open the whole time, never closed ever. I mean, Tristan were in nightclubs the entire time people were locked in their houses. Mm -hmm. Nobody talks about this. It's like, no one mentions it anymore. But you have to use your mind to break the trap. And I feel like I've tried to allow my mind to be psyoped into this transgender stuff or this abortion stuff. And even I can't even pretend to buy into it. I can't see how you can reach that level of delusion. And that's where I say, maybe it must be Darwinism because maybe even with all of my mental capacity, I can't even pretend to be stupid enough to want to go and chop my genitalia off to then imitate a woman, poorly imitate a woman for the rest of my human years. That literally sounds like a form of torture. That sounds like one of the worst existences ever. I feel sorry for anyone who's fallen for that yeah. because they're never going to be what they want to be ever. It's just, it's just like the worst possible existence. I just can't think of anything possibly worse. And I don't know, maybe there's a Darwinistic element to all of these things. If we can just control the culture and make sure that no future children are psyoped into the death cult, maybe it should all fall apart because people who truly are that susceptible, me and my brother have a joke in the house. There's flies and mosquitoes in the house sometimes. Every time one of us kills a fly, we say, you've improved the gene pool because the slow one got killed. <laughs> the fast one, he doesn't get killed. So the fast one's going to be here forever. I'm going to think about that every time I kill a fly. Every time you kill a fly, you're, you're helping them get quicker. If, you didn't, if we didn't kill flies all these millions of years, they would never be so elusive. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know. Maybe there's a Darwinistic element. Maybe I'm just trying to feel better about maybe, this. Yeah, maybe they're, they're, they're so evil they've decided we're going to kill off all of the people that are stupid. I, I don't know. And then we'll be left with just strong, independent. But then they, they can't control the strong, independent people. So then you, you kind of, you got, you got a bit of a problem there. I've got another question for you. How polarized do you think the world is? Do you think there's two teams? Do you think the globalists control everything? Do you think there's three or four teams? What do you think about that? I think it's probably now divided into two teams. Yeah. Because now you have to find more in common. It's like, how crazy are you? We may have been divided into four, five, six, but now it's like, do you believe that children should chop their off? Right. Or yes. Yes or no. Circle yes or no. Yeah. yeah, Right. That's where we're at. Because you have to be so far deluded to believe this. And if you're just in some realm of sanity, we probably have enough in common that we should fight together. Right. Just because like they're going after the kids now. It's like, and I think that is really where we got divided into two categories where it's like, you're either pro going after the children or you're against going after the children. And it's remarkable how many people are pro letting them go after the children. It's, it's, it's kind of scary, but that's where we're, I, I think it's now pretty much two camps. It used to be more. I think so also. And then within you, obviously there's little battles and, and, and to me they're meaningless. Yep. I think maybe I'm saying that because I'm a mom and now, so there's nothing more important to me than protecting children and worrying about what my children are going to face. I'm going to be the crazy mom when my kids are at school. I will be there every single day looking over every, Amazing. every assignment, Amazing. leaning fully into the feminine role Amazing. of like, yeah. So I, but I, I do think now it's come down to two camps. It's crazy and not crazy. I wonder what the future of the world is, Candace. I feel like I know everything and I talk like I know everything, but I'm actually starting to think things are getting Your dad strange. might have had an idea. Yeah, I wish he was still around, yeah. but things are starting to get very, very strange. And yeah, and I, I guess also when we're talking about me, my libertarianism versus conservatism, I never, like, I would never allow my child to be aborted ever. I do think it's heinous and disgusting, but I will be honest with you. When I see people trying that hard to kill their kids, I'm kind of like, I'm not going to lie. I, I, maybe that's the libertarianism in me. Maybe, I don't know. But I'm just like, there's got to be a Darwinistic element to some of these things. I don't think they should happen. I would love to stop them all. I believe that all life is precious. I think it's heinous. I don't think that anyone should chop off any of their body parts either. But it does get to a point where it's just like, if you're that desperate to damage your own life and damage yourself, am I the person who's going to fight for you? I don't know. Well, these women are broken and they're brainwashed. And I like to think that if they hear the right message, something in the same way that I think a lot of broken men heard you say something and it woke something up inside of them. Very true. I think that they can land on my message and they can hear it and go, wait a second, that thing that was killed inside of me systematically from the school system and made me think that what it meant to be a woman was to be a whore, because yep. that's kind of the message yep. that's going out right now, 100%. to be a whore yep. and hate children, yep. which is the opposite of what it means to be a woman. Agreed. Then when they hear something and I talk about how aspirational family is and something is, or how much I love being a mother and, yeah. it, and then I think inside of them, this, something spiritual happens where they go, wait a second, I think that's actually what I am. Yeah. I, I've been conditioned to believe I'm this, but actually this is what I am. So I'm, I'm more hopeful that the more that we have better pillars in society that we have people speaking out on the opposite messaging that Hollywood is bringing on the, on the glory of being a woman, on the beautiful of the yin and the yang, on that submission in a marriage is not a bad thing. Actually, it's a beautiful thing. I agree. And these messages have been perverted that where we make a difference. And I think we, we know we're winning. No, we are. Now they want censorship. Now they want the people taken off the internet. Now they want this person to go down and that they weren't doing that when they were winning. They didn't care. We were allowed. Everybody was allowed to have a platform when Obama was president. Completely true. (laughs) We are winning. And I just think it's an unfortunate of the human condition that people don't really like to learn lessons the easy way. They have to learn them the very hard way. And it's very difficult for us to sometimes sit and tell people the truth and even and they just don't want to learn it until it's too late. I like to think that these women who hold up these, I lost 10 babies, I killed 10 baby signs, will one day wake up and feel very sad about what they've done. Yeah. And they'll definitely- And it's possible. Right? And it's possible. And I think even time will show them, God will show them with time. I don't know how I'd talk someone out of the transgender argument. Like, how would you convince someone who is 100% certain they want to mutilate their body to not mutilate their body? I don't, that's a scary one to me because their mind- And that's also one that you can't really undo, which I think is sad, which is why the suicide rates go up after transitioning, I think, is once you do it, it you've committed. But I've seen, I've sat down with a, a man that did that, had the full surgery. His name is Walt Heyer, and he's, he's dedicated the rest of his life to waking up other 
Uh, well, that's the most noble thing you can do. Yeah. He's like, you know, this is what I did. I, this is how I was convinced. This is how I was brainwashed. This is what happened to me. I was actually just molested when I was a kid. And I just wanted to get rid of my identity in any capacity. So I did the most extreme thing that I could possibly do. I platformed those individuals. And I think that he's he runs a not-for-profit now, which, you know, sex change regret. There's many people that are like him out there. And yeah, it, it, it's going to take God. It's going to take spiritualism. And it's going to take repurposing your entire life after you do something that extreme. Hopefully just us having this conversation prevents people from making those sorts of very serious decisions. And, you know, but this is why YouTube will try to censor this conversation. Oh, right? okay. I mean, well, that's the whole point. Is my, face, my face is on it. You're in trouble. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you a few more questions if you don't mind. My face is troubled too. I would just like to state. Yeah, of course. Of course it is. <laughs> why do you think marriage has reduced in the Western world? Why do you think less people are getting married than before? Conditioning. It's all about social conditioning. And it's about uh, the feminist messaging, going back to the, our conversation about the matriarchy. They've totally conditioned women to believe that marriage is a trap, that you are going to be unhappy, that you are going to be sacrificing your freedom. When in reality, I got more freedom than I ever had when I became married yeah. because I, I finally became a secure woman. Yeah. I knew what my purpose in life was when I had children. Yeah. Everything else is so stupid and meaningless. How could you think you were going to find your purpose in the bottom of a Red Bull vodka at One Oak, Candace? You know what I mean? <laughs> How could you think that? Well, because that's what that's what Hollywood told me. That's what I, I saw on MTV. Yeah. And I thought that was all aspiration. I look at those women, I think they're miserable. I look at these people, that women that are, uh, are still finding their freedom. I say, find the number one feminist that you know and ask yourself a question. Do you think she's happy? Completely. Chasing her career. Do you think Chelsea Handler's happy? Never. Right? And the answer is no. And so I'm I'm lucky that I got that wake up call. I'm blessed that I got married. I'm blessed that I have, you know, three children now with, with this one on the way. And the more that I can talk about how happy and fulfilled I am for the first time in my life, right? Not when I was drinking and pretending to be happy, but for the first time I actually am happy. And I got those things by finally realizing that the message that those things were going to constrain me was utterly false and was meant to put me down a path of misery. Do you think, why do you think men are not getting married? That's women. Do you think men have something to do with it? As Same well? thing. I think, well, first and foremost, I think, and I speak out on this, women are not desirable right now. Everyone's a Kim Kardashian clone. I asked you earlier, what, what don't men want? And you said promiscuity. Well, that seems about the only thing that's being offered right now. <laughs> when I open my Instagram and I've got butt cheeks and I'm going, people are like, I don't understand why no one wants to, this woman's been married four times. I'm like, well, I can, I can understand it because even if men think they want it in the short term, when you see a girl, she's half naked, she looks good. Yeah, sure. You probably do want to have sex with her. I bet yeah. you're wired that way. You're yeah. hardwired wired that way. Yeah. But then what happens after you after you have sex and you realize that so did 20 other dudes 100%. in the same week, you don't want her. You nailed it. You yeah. absolutely not only nailed it. And this is where it's so, we're in such a difficult, it's a race to the bottom with, between the two genders. Right? Yeah. As the women act worse, the men act worse men act by worse. extension. Yeah. <laughs> because if you're going to be moral in an immoral world, you're going to end up wrecked. Right. So it's getting harder and harder. So we have to kind of like fix one of the genders first. Women, and, women aren't desirable right now as in the Western hemisphere as a whole. Um, and of course, there finding a wife is hard. Finding a wife is hard. And it's because women are literally being conditioned to behave like sluts. Completely. And they're also being conditioned to leave the man as soon as things get difficult. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of programming in this. I don't think even many people pick up on. But women are conditioned to act a certain way before marriage. But also during marriage, men and women are conditioned differently. If you have a man who's been married for 10 or 15 years, and let's say he doesn't sleep with his woman anymore, and he goes on TV and says, me and my woman have been married for 15 years, we no longer have sex, I'm not satisfied, I should leave. Everyone will say to him, no, you can't leave. You can't leave her just because she won't have sex with you. Are you out of your mind? Are you crazy? Stick by your woman. She has an emotional problem, et cetera. If you had a woman who said, I've been married for 15 years, I've been with him, I'm not attracted anymore, I don't have sex with him anymore. You deserve freedom. You can go get someone else. Why are you putting up with this? You, his, his feelings aren't your responsibility. So it's actually very interesting. Also, the psyop happens post-marriage. Women are also attacked post-marriage to not try, not stick around, not worry well, about their husband's marriage, needs. Speaking to your point, I, I, one thing I speak to the young women that follow me about is making an effort after you get married. This idea, I, I was reading this ridiculous column, Ask Jane, where a guy was writing in or in, in earnest saying, you know, I love my wife. She's a wonderful uh, mother to our children. We've been married. Uh, she had one child. Two, two years later, she gained 50 pounds and hasn't lost it. Yeah. And the 
Jane wrote back to him and yelled at him for saying, he's like, he's like, I'm not attracted to her anymore. I don't want to. Just yelled at him for even saying this. I'm going, no, this is the, why are you yelling at him for being honest? The idea that marriage is a finish line is problematic. That, oh, well, I got the guy. I pretended that I like to work out and go to the gym. And now that I've got him, I'm going to gain 200 pounds and he's just stuck with me. That is a poisonous mentality. You should make an effort for your husband. Uh, Part of, that's part of marriage is caring about each other, caring about each other's health. Health is wealth. So it's even that is toxicity to say to a woman, well, to say to a man, well, you just have to like her anyways if she's 300 pounds and doesn't care anymore and sits on the couch all day. That That's not what marriage is really about. Completely agree. And I think everything in life is rented. I don't think anything is ever owned. I think that your health is rented and you have to pay the rent every day. And right. your marriage is rented and you have to work on your marriage every day. And your business is rented and everything you have is rented. I think the idea that even owning anything or anything is a finish line is wrong. Right. You don't just start a company and go, okay, I'm rich now. No, you got to work on that company every day. It's rented. You don't just get in shape and go, I'm in shape now. It's done. No, it's absolutely everything's the same and a relationship is, is exactly the same. And I completely agree with you. I think that the breakdown of the nuclear family and the breakdown of marriage in the West is actually one of the ills and one of the big problems with it. I am not married myself, so I'm not being completely, I don't want to come across as hypocritical, but I do think that is actually a a fast way to a degree to solve a lot of problems in society. I do think, though, in the current setup of society, I think the reason a lot of men are also rejecting marriage is, one, because there's not many wives to find, but two, I think a lot of men find themselves very unhappy in marriage because the women have no interest at all in satisfying them, like you said, or no interest at all in, in their needs. And they end up scared of divorcing her because they're going to be bankrupt in a marriage where they don't feel respected. Kids don't listen to them and they're not the king of their own household. So what would be the attraction in getting married unless you're going to be the king of your own household? And that can be extrapolated and discussed in two different ways. One about feminine uh, submissiveness, but also about masculine accountability and excellence. Because I think if you're truly an excellent man, you can be the king of any household. So it's very interesting. It's kind of interesting how all arguments come back to almost the same base biological things. And you teach women to be good women, you teach men to be good men, and everything kind of works out after that. And if you break those two things, everything built on top of it completely degrades and breaks down. Because even all the other things we've discussed, we discussed how masculinity would have prevented a lot of the COVID crisis. We can talk about how genuine masculinity or a good nuclear family and anti-propagandist dinner table can prevent a lot of this transgender insanity. There's a whole so many things can be fixed with a man being a man and a woman being a woman. It's like the it's ultimate biology, pure. Is what yeah. I always say, and it's so natural defining the roles in the household. So like me, my husband had to sit down, and it, it just was. I had a natural proclivity to do certain things. Yeah. I, I always give the greatest example: the, when a baby is born, the men don't know what to do for the first. You, you just need your your girls. You know, the, they they just are. What do I do? And I remember like every thinking about every diaper size transitioning what clothes he needed what onesies all of the stuff george not there right not there i think it, georgie must have been that's my son's name georgie must have been two months old and i said something to i don't even what i said to george but i had realized that george had already opened his college account truck like yeah. things that i when i tell you my brain yep. was no i was just like where are you? Yep. Where are I'm sitting here thinking about the day to day. He's thinking about his future. 100%. I, I don't even know when I would have. I think still to this day, George is now two and a half. I still would not have opened an account for him. It just is not where my brain was. 100%. And so I just, I love telling that story because it just speaks to how different. I, I'm like, did you try to feed him? He's like, I don't know why he's crying. I'm like, have you tried giving him food? <laughs> and then he's like, oh, I've already sorted out this. His bank account did us when he turns 18. So I'm like, where are you? Yeah. Men and women are different. It's beautiful. Those differences are beautiful. Completely. The sex, sex differences are a beautiful, thing. Our our instincts are beautiful yep. and we need to stop shunning them in this society. I, I love being a woman. I love that my husband's a man. We shouldn't be making someone feel badly about being a woman. We shouldn't make someone feel badly about being a man. Well, absolutely. And I, if, if I had to be pessimistic about why they're doing it, pessimistic and also very realistic, they want to cause absolute chaos and confusion because during chaos and confusion, you can implement anything. Of course, slavery. Then, it's slavery, right? People will give up their freedom for only one thing. And that's safety. Mm -hmm. So they have to inject chaos and they have to inject confusion and they want us confused at every level. At every base level, they want you confused. They want you confused about why your kid doesn't listen to you, why your marriage doesn't work, why you're broke, why they want you confused from the ground all the way up. So you're just confused. So when they come along with some sort of solution, no matter what garbage it is, you end up just adopting it because you're sick and you need a medicine. 
So absolutely, they attack masculinity and femininity because it works so perfectly together. And if they can break that, they can break all of society by extension. And I think they've done a pretty good job of doing exactly that. And it's amazing if you look at these ideas we discuss and how ridiculous they are and how I feel like it's a psyop to even convince me to waste my time convincing people that a man is not a woman. It's done on purpose because they have the world so confused now that they can come at us with absolute garbage and it needs a discussion. If we had the basis of masculinity and femininity in the household, how much harder would the transgender argument be to implement? Think about it. Well, she's a woman, I'm a man. No. But now they've got people thinking we're all the same. It doesn't matter. Gender is not real. All this craziness because of the breakdown of the basics. So this is why perhaps they see you as such a threat and they see me as such a threat and they see us as such a threat because we've just stuck to the age old adages and the age old ways that people have always been. And I do think that one of the reasons why they dislike me so much is because, yeah, I, I certainly live a teenage boy's dream. If you want to inspire the next generation, how else are you going to do it, right? You have to have the fancy car and the big yacht and all these things. And, and by inspiring these men to stand up and think for themselves and resist the slave mind, it's doing genuine damage to their slave agenda, genuine damage to their slave agenda. And I think that that's why I especially ended up targeted. I truly believe that's what's happening. I think there is an element of it that it's you, you've captivated young men, and that is a very important demographic in order to sustain um, an enslaved population is you, you need to poison men. And I think that that is true. So in closing, other than the fact that we've agreed that you're going to get married in the next five years. Sure. <laughs> I get four wives. No, 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 not four wives, just one monogamous relationship. Okay. What does Andrew Tate's life look like in the next five years? You've, you've built your audience. You did it you're with your own grit and determination. There are people following you. I hope that if there's anything I leave you with, it's that in those moments when you are sitting across with someone like Adam 22, you remember that there's the 12 year old and the 13 year old boy that is going to be watching you. And I think you did a good job, by the way. I think you said that you didn't like it and that Thank was important you. enough. But what is what does the next five years look like for you? Yeah, I want to do my absolute best. I, I had someone say to me the other day that I'm the richest man in the world and not because of my finances, but because I actually have people whose lives I save and help. And I get a lot of people out there who genuinely feel a lot better because of me. And I try my very best to tell the truth and live true to my heart. And I, I live with my brother and I've got a lovely family and I feel like I've got everything almost ticked off. And my plans for the future are primarily to continue to tell the truth. I think that we're now winning. I think there's been a pendulum that's swung and people are tired of insanity and they're tired of being lied to. I like the idea of young boys who follow me just doing even one of the tenets I teach. If you want to just work hard in the gym and become a fantastic financial, uh, physical condition, or if you want to get financially secure, just one of the tenets I teach can genuinely improve people's lives. I like the idea of that. And I want to have 10 sons. And I need to make sure that all 10 are Andrew Tate, four, five, six, I'm the third, seven, eight, nine, all the way up. And I have to make sure that the next generation are being produced and they have to be strong enough to deal with a Romanian jail cell and deal with a matrix attack. <laughs> so it's going to be a very difficult upbringing. And I'm going to make sure that I'm very dedicated and focused on creating the next generation of super soldiers to resist enslavement. So my plans for the future are pretty simple. I'm going to continue to tell the truth. I'm going to live true to myself, true to God. I really appreciate the audience he's given me. And I know that I have a massive responsibility. It makes me a better person. I'm going to be the best person I know how to be. And I'm going to have 10 Andrew Tates. That's my goal. That's the plan. <laughs> well, you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. If you thought one Andrew Tate was bad, you've got 10 more coming at you in the near future. Andrew, thank you so much for taking all of this thank time. You. Such a good conversation. Thank you. <laughs>